I was chilling at Tony's Pub in Blackwood Village, New Jersey, my favorite watering hole after a tough day at the factory. My buddies Malcolm and Chad were there too, as we exchanged work stories and laughed about Chad's recent dating disaster. Man, I swear those dating apps are the modern-day equivalent of Russian roulette. Malcolm chuckled. You think you're getting a ten, but bam! You're one swipe away from the jaws of despair. As the night wore on and the drinks flowed like waterfalls, our conversation shifted to more nonsense and obscure topics. Chad brought up rumors about recent attacks involving people and animals found not just dead but torn to pieces. Of course, we all laughed it off. Nobody could possibly believe such crap, right? But around midnight, that laughter stopped as clearly as a gunshot. A local farmer named Jeb stumbled into the bar in a disheveled state. He looked like he'd run through hell with his clothes half ripped off him. The place went silent as Jeb stood there, panting. Goddamn bastards, you killed my cows! He managed to stutter between breaths. What happened? I asked as we all tried to process his condition. Jeb told us that some huge beast had broken into his barn and brutally slaughtered his cattle, livestock his family depended on for their livelihood. As he described their enormous size and bloodlust like nothing he'd ever seen before, my mind raced with thoughts of who had committed this unspeakable act. I looked over at Malcolm and Chad for any sign they were still laughing at Jeb's bizarre claim, yet it was clear from their stony expressions they were taking him seriously. Days passed after the incident at Jeb's farm and fear began to darken our small community when more reports of vicious attacks surfaced. Not just animals, but people had also been brutally assaulted by these unknown creatures, some of whom we'd taken shots with at Tony's pub. Our once peaceful lives were thrown into chaos as we faced the horrifying reality that our town was now a hunting ground for savage predators. My buddies and I tried to carry on as usual, but the threat hung over us like a storm cloud. Malcolm, one evening, brought up an old legend about werewolves that could shift from human form into monstrous beasts that stalked the area centuries ago. But Chad, our resident skeptic, laughed bitterly at this idea and called it nothing more than utter bullshit. As we were arguing over what these creatures could be, Two more friends came by the bar. They had found what seemed to be the tracks of gigantic canines right outside their homes. Panic began to spread in every corner of Blackwood Village. The next day, a curfew was imposed on all residents to protect them from dangers lurking in the area. It didn't feel like a solution. It was more like putting a bandage on an arterial wound. We all knew it wouldn't keep us safe, but we still obliged because we were too scared to venture out at night anymore. My daily routine became living in fear. I barely slept, listening closely to every sound outside my house in fear that some werewolf or dogman would come crashing through my windows. One evening after work, I was grabbing some essentials from the store when I found myself cornered by Malcolm and Chad. Dave, you've got to come with us tonight, Chad urged me nervously. We're putting together a posse. People are arming themselves and patrolling around town. God knows what's going on, but we can't let whatever these things are win. I couldn't help but agree with him. We couldn't just wait until it was too late. So that night, armed with guns, something I never thought I'd ever have to carry in my life. We joined the group of men venturing out. After hours of searching, we came upon one horrifying scene of mutilation after another while also realizing we were being stalked by these ferocious creatures. They were playing with us, and we were powerless. As I hid behind a tree, I could see the shadows of massive bodies moving in and out of sight. 
Their eyes met mine for a fraction of a second before they vanished into the darkness. Crouching with sweat pouring down my face, we closed in around what we thought might be their lair. A gut-wrenching growl echoed through the woods, sending shivers down my spine. The shadows around us seemed to come alive, and a massive shape emerged, its glowing red eyes radiating pure evil. It was covered in thick, matted fur, with powerful limbs and razor-sharp claws that could tear a man apart in mere seconds. It felt like time stood still as the beast scanned our group, pausing for a moment to examine each of our horrified expressions. Then, without warning, it charged straight at us, its growl turning into a blood-curdling roar. My heart raced as I raised my gun and fired in a desperate attempt to protect myself and my friends. Bullets hit the creature with sickening thuds but did nothing to slow it down. It pounced on one of the men in our posse, ripping his arm clean off before tossing him aside like a ragdoll. Chad and Malcolm began firing as well, their fear manifesting into rapid shots in the beast's direction. Their bullets piercing its hide had no effect on it either. The monster seemed almost impervious to pain. Realizing firearms were doing no good, I threw my gun down and grabbed a nearby tree branch, at least something heavy to swing against the creature. The monstrosity lunged for Chad, grabbing hold of him with its massive paws. He didn't stand a chance. Within seconds, he was ripped apart, his blood splattering all around us. Malcolm screamed out to Chad but was cut short by another attack from the beast, this time aimed directly at him. In that instant of carnage, I spotted an opportunity. The creature's grotesque maw opened wide as it bit down on Malcolm, revealing an array of dagger-like teeth. Noticing that it flinched every time someone stabbed or hit any object really close to its eye sockets from their fight frames moments ago, I knew what to do. With one last primal howl, I swung the thick branch with all my strength at the creature's eye. Miraculously, the makeshift weapon connected, and it reeled backward in agony. Rage quickly turned into fear as the beast realized its vulnerability, and it scrambled to get away from us. I clung on to Malcolm, torn and disfigured but alive, just barely. The two other unfortunate souls who hadn't survived stared blankly at me from their cold, dead eyes. Consumed by fear and shock, I scrambled with Malcolm away from the bloodbath. Injured and vulnerable, we limped back to town, forever changed by what we'd endured. Word spread throughout Blackwood Village like wildfire. Stories about our encounter swept through every household, each more exaggerated than the last. The once peaceful town was now gripped by terror, hardened by the reality that monsters truly walked among us. The encounters with the beasts continued. They seemed almost vengeful now, emboldened by a newfound rage towards those that had dared to stand against them. Creatures once nameless to us now became synonymous with their reign of terror. They were finally recognized as the true adversaries we had to face. However, Blackwood also had a newfound determination to stand against these forces of darkness. Hushed whispers behind closed doors spoke of secret meetings and research into ancient lore, hoping against hope to find some way to save their community from this terrible curse. In time, people understood that there were some evils too great for mere men to conquer alone, that battles waged between humanity and dark creatures would only ever end in heartache and bloodshed. The town bordering on collapse adapted. We came together as a community more tightly knit than ever before. Distrust turned into camaraderie. Our eyes no longer turned nervously towards one another but instead met as friends united to keep our loved ones safe. In the end, the creatures receded into the darkness that birthed them. 
Their sporadic attacks plagued the outskirts of Blackwood Village, but no longer pierced our hearts and minds. We knew that true evil existed, sometimes lurking right beneath the surface. Life carried on, but a part of us would always be in those woods, forever haunted by the memories of that fateful night in Tony's pub. And as each day turned into night and darkness draped across this sleepy village, we remained vigilant, our eyes wary, watching for signs of those nightmare shadows to perch and prowl again someday. Well, let me tell you the story. I've been itching to get this off my chest for a while. This happened back in February of 2009, right after the Super Bowl. My friends and I were hanging out, having a few beers in celebration of our team's victory. We had gathered in my buddy Nick's backyard near Blackwood Village in Gloucester Township, New Jersey. His backyard was surrounded by dense woods, giving us a perfect sense of tranquility away from the busy streets. As the evening progressed, we noticed an overwhelming stench that seemed to be coming from the woods nearby. It smelled like a mix of wet dog and rotten meat rolled into one. We tried to ignore it but eventually decided to move our little get-together indoors to escape the putrid smell. Around midnight, as we were winding down and talking about the game's highlights, we heard what sounded like someone or something rummaging through Nick's garage. We laughed it off, joking that maybe some poor raccoon got trapped in there and was trying to find its way out. Being slightly buzzed and always up for some entertainment, we ventured outside to investigate. As we approached the garage door, I took a deep breath before cautiously opening it. Inside, everything seemed normal aside from a few knocked over cans of paint. However, the smell had grown stronger. Now it was coupled with whiffs of iron, like someone spilled a bucket of pennies on freshly painted roadkill. We continued exploring until we saw something horrifying behind Nick's car a mutilated deer corpse that looked like it had been torn apart by something with incomprehensible strength. The deer's entrails were strewn about. It was beyond gruesome. After taking in this ghastly sight, all of us were visibly shaken but couldn't help but ask ourselves, what could have done this? Jokingly, our friend Kevin said that maybe it was a werewolf. While we tried to laugh it off, the thought lingered in all of our minds. Seeing that there wasn't much more we could do, we decided to call the police and have them investigate further. They arrived half an hour later, taking statements from each of us and examining the gory scene themselves. Back inside, we were trying to settle down after our recent discovery when we noticed something moving in the dimly lit woods behind Nick's backyard. All conversation ceased. Our eyes were locked on the shadowy figure darting between trees. The rational part of our brains argued that it must be someone messing with us, but the gut feeling told us otherwise. Hey asshole! Cut it out! shouted Kevin through the open window. The figure stopped as if momentarily startled and then proceeded to stand upright. What stood before us was a towering beast around eight feet tall, covered in thick fur, and with massive glowing eyes like burning embers in the moonlight. We realized that this couldn't possibly be a person or any animal known to man, as its sheer size and shape defied all reason. Its snout resembled that of a wolf, but the arms and legs were comparable to a human's physique, albeit grotesquely oversized. It let out a blood-curdling howl that made every hair on our bodies stand on end. We panicked, sprinting back into the house and slamming the door shut behind us. I fumbled with my phone and called 911 again, breathlessly relaying what we just witnessed to the operator. We were too horrified to speak and huddled together, 
praying for help to arrive soon. Only 30 minutes had passed since the police had first left, so it didn't take long for them to return. This time, the officers brought reinforcements and a sense of urgency not present in their earlier visit. We could see their flashlights darting around through the trees as they searched for the monstrous creature lurking outside. We knew they wouldn't find anything. How could they possibly fight such a beast? But their presence was like a security blanket, offering us at least some comfort in an otherwise terrifying situation. Keith, Nick's neighbor, had been heading home from his late-night shift at a nearby gas station when he noticed the police gathered at Nick's house. Curiosity peaked. He approached us and asked what was going on. As we recounted our nightmarish experience to Keith, his face turned pale with fear. He admitted that several pets in the neighborhood had been reported missing or found dead in recent weeks. The cops called off their search around 3 a.m. without finding any sign of the creature. Dejected and doubtful they would ever find answers, they warned us to keep our distance from the woods and barricade ourselves inside until further notice. Following their advice, we locked all windows and doors before trying to get some sleep, though sleeping seemed impossible amid such terror. The next day was harrowing as we continued to grapple with our horrifying encounter while struggling to find even an ounce of peace. We got very little sleep that night, and every night thereafter, as we took turns keeping watch, though we knew how futile that would likely be against an eight-foot-tall monster. Miraculously, despite how disturbed we felt, there were no further incidents for the next few days. The community was soon buzzing with talk of this mysterious beast and the terror it wrought upon our little gathering. On the fifth day after our experience, the police came back again, this time with a report from a local hunter. The man had been deep in the woods near Blackwood Village on the night after we'd seen the creature. To his shock and horror, he stumbled upon a makeshift lair. Piles of bones, fur, and decomposing flesh were scattered across a large clearing. Traces of deer blood streaked across the ground, leading back to Nick's garage. They were clearly leftovers from some gruesome feasts. This news left us all with mixed emotions, fear that this lair signaled a continuing presence but relief that we now had some tangible evidence of the beast that had tormented us. Multiple search parties scoured the woods over the course of those five days, desperate to find this nightmarish creature. But it seemed as though it had vanished into thin air. As time went on, our memories of that horrifying night began to fade. Daily routines resumed, and laughter slowly returned to our small gatherings at Nick's home, though never outdoors past midnight again. That harrowing experience changed all of us in some way or another but also brought us closer together as friends and neighbors, united by one terrifying fact. We knew something was out there, something unspeakable and vicious, and whether we liked it or not, danger still lurked just beyond the edge of those dark woods near Blackwood Village. A couple of years ago, my buddies and I decided to go on a weekend camping trip upstate. Despite the cynical remarks regarding how terrible life would be without Wi-Fi or Netflix for a weekend, we were all secretly excited about the opportunity to get out of the city and breathe some fresh air. Little did we know what we were getting ourselves into. We arrived at our campsite a beautiful clearing within an isolated forest. The sun was setting as we unloaded our gear and set up our tents, relieved to finally be in nature and away from the stress of day-to-day -day life. As night fell, we sat around the campfire, roasting hot dogs and swapping old stories, 
occasionally cracking up at some humiliating high school memory that one of us tried to forget. Man, do you remember the time Devin ran through the hallway naked just before the big game? Ryan asked cheekily. The poor guy still regrets drinking all that bourbon. I chuckled. It was around midnight when we suddenly heard what sounded like heavy footsteps in the distance. At first, we dismissed it as just one of us stepping away for a minute, but we couldn't shake off the feeling that something wasn't right. The sound carried a certain weight to it that didn't quite resemble human footsteps. It was almost like there were more than just two legs making contact with the ground. Trying to ignore the uneasiness growing among us, we continued talking and joking around until an unnerving howl echoed through the woods. We all froze, realizing this was something far different from your regular coyote yelp. The next morning, curiosity had gotten the better of us, so Dylan and I decided to investigate whatever had been lurking around our campsite last night. We quietly tracked down several canine-like footprints that were curiously larger than any coyote prints I had ever seen. As if on cue, Ryan seemed hesitant and quipped. You're not turning this into some cryptozoology hoax, right? Cause I didn't sign up for a werewolf hunting trip. Relax, man. We're just trying to figure out what caused those howls. It's probably just a big old dog that ran away from his leash. Dylan reassured him. That night, we put extra logs on the fire in hopes of warding off whatever creature had been disturbing us. I could see that even though everyone tried to brush it off as a wild animal, an air of unease still hung over the group. We decided to turn in early, hoping that tomorrow would bring some answers. In the dead of night, somewhere between sleep and consciousness, I heard the crunching of twigs and leaves nearby our campsite again. This time it was incredibly close. I could almost sense the creature breathing heavily outside our tent. It was nearly pitch black, but just as I peered out the small window flap, my heart sank. There it was, a menacing silhouette lurking by the edge of our campfire. Now I could see this thing, a giant cross between a wolf and a human. I instinctively began to shake my friends awake, desperately trying to avoid alerting the beast outside my tent with any sudden movements. The heavy steps grew closer and louder, and I felt a gut-wrenching terror sweep through me like never before. Just when we thought it impossible to avoid an inevitable confrontation with this horrifying being, in a frenzy of panic, I managed to whisper urgently, Guys, it's here. It's outside the tent. Their eyes widened as they tried to stifle their fear and keep quiet. We huddled together, hearts pounding, dreading the inevitable. As the creature approached our tent, we could hear soft growls echoing from its throat. The fire had long since gone out, and we were left in complete darkness. At 2.12 a.m., we heard a gut-churning sound as the beast tore through our supplies just a few feet away from us. It seemed to be searching for something. But then, just as suddenly as it began, it stopped. The growls and ripping noises ceased, replaced only by heavy breathing. It seemed to realize that what it was searching for wasn't there perhaps because it was sitting right there with us in the tent. Casting aside all my fears, I knew I had to take action before we were picked off one by one. I grabbed my Swiss army knife in one hand and whispered my plan to my friends in short sentences in a barely audible voice. They nodded their agreement. They understood that this was our only chance if we wanted to survive this nightmare. Risking our lives in a split-second decision at 2.28 a.m., we burst out of the tent simultaneously, screaming at the top of our lungs and waving anything we had in our hands, sticks and knives alike, to frighten the creature. 
Its menacing appearance was more horrifying than I could have imagined. Standing taller than any human being and covered in thick gray fur, it recoiled at our very presence. And yet, as we created chaos around it while staying away from its long claws dripping with blood from tearing apart our belongings earlier, it slowly began to retreat from us, displaying confusion rather than anger like we expected. At this point, all hope seemed lost as two more beastly creatures emerged from the tree line with the same sinister appearance. This was the point of no return. We had no choice but to face our end with whatever courage we had left. Then, as if it sensed our dreadful acceptance of impending doom, something extraordinary happened. The first creature stepped forward, placing itself between us and its companions. As if in communication with them, the other creatures hesitated and then returned to the darkness of the forest. The creature that protected us reveled in its victory. Its eyes glowed with triumph while letting out a deep, spine-shivering howl. This second howl resonated differently from when we heard it just a few nights ago. It carried a sense of closure and command. As it turned away from us and into the darkness of the woods, following its companions' paths, one final glance was thrown at us with a hint of intelligence and understanding far beyond what any wild animal could possess. Then it vanished. In shaken silence, we dragged ourselves back into the tent and huddled together once more. Sleep eluded us as we remained wide awake until sunrise, processing every improbable event of that horrendous night. When morning finally arrived at 6.45 a.m., no trace of the previous night's terror was left in sight except for our scattered supplies and our scarred minds. It took all our strength to pack up and leave that place behind with haste. We vowed never to speak of that weekend again, to pretend as though it never happened, and never to set foot in those woods again. And though days turned into years without an answer or explanation for what the terrifying beings were, many have theorized they were protectors, guarding us from an even greater danger lurking within those haunted trees. I'm convinced there are things out there, unseen creatures, that defy explanation. Yet they exist on an entirely different plane than we can comprehend. My only hope is that whatever divine intervention took place that wretched night will not be forgotten, as some mysteries should be left unsolved. They only serve as reminders that we are not alone in this vast world. My chest burned. I can only assume it was the dry air up here at this forest cabin we rented in Northern California. My brother, Mike, came up to me while I patted the sweat off my forehead. Phew, we climbed so many stairs to get up here. Feel that burn? He chuckled, mocking my exhaustion. Yeah, real funny, I said reluctantly, glad my annoyance distracted me from my panting. Being a computer programmer, mountain climbing was not exactly part of my daily activities. The first few days passed smoothly, with days spent hiking or doing mundane tasks around the cabin and evenings spent grilling and settling into deeper conversations with my brother. We reveled in our isolation, a chance to escape our hectic jobs and daily lives. One evening during dinner, Mike started describing some creepy stories from Reddit about people going missing in these types of isolated areas. Obviously, I reminded him how far wildfire could spread those spooky stories by telling tales about anything that starts with a friend of a friend. Our conversation shifted when we heard a strange noise outside the cabin. It sounded like scratching. Not the nails on a chalkboard kind, but more like thick branches scraping against walls. Mike suggested it might be an animal trying to get into the garbage we've forgotten to put away. 
As we walked out onto the porch with flashlights, the scratching stopped suddenly. Instead of finding a raccoon causing trouble, we discovered deep gouge marks in the wood by the garbage area. A shiver shot through us as we quickly began surveying our surroundings with unsteady flashlights. The noise didn't return that night. Still, as the following days went on, our light-hearted attitude shifted into unease whenever dusk arrived. At every creek or distant snap in the woods, our eyes darted toward each other involuntarily. Mike claimed he even heard breathing right outside his bedroom window one night. On our second-to-last night, we laid out a plan. Armed with makeshift weapons, I carried a large iron cooking skillet, and Mike wielded his pocket knife, we decided to search the perimeter after dark. We weren't going to let some weird incidents ruin our trip. It never occurred to us that we were being paranoid in a completely rational way. Our flashlights cut through the darkness cautiously and methodically, with only our nerves guiding us. Every beam of light swiped through the dense brush and trees, illuminating every hiding spot imaginable. Our feet nervously trampled over leaves and twigs, echoing in the black night. We saw nothing unusual, yet every little movement felt like we were inching closer to some ghastly discovery. As we drew near the other side of the cabin, a sudden snarl pierced the air. It was unnatural, unlike anything we'd ever heard before, as if an animal were trying to mimic human laughter. Suddenly, a hulking figure leapt from the tree lean, its hunger in its red eyes evident even in our shaky flashlight beams. Never had I imagined something like this could exist. It was half human and half animal, with thick matted fur covering its muscular frame. Shoving my weapon into Mike's hands, I shouted for him to cover me while I scrambled from my phone to dial 911. The creature charged at us, its colossal arms ripping a branch from a nearby tree effortlessly. Mike swung wildly, managing precisely two panicked hits before collapsing under the creature's relentless attack. I moved faster than I thought possible, latching onto its trespassing form with the adrenaline of sheer terror coursing through me. The beast roared in pain, its blackened blood oozing from the wounds Mike had inflicted just moments before. I grasped the opportunity, and armed with the heavy skillet, smashed it against the creature's head. Stunned but not defeated, it stumbled back, giving us precious seconds to make our escape. We sprinted towards the cabin, limbs trembling and hearts pounding. Once inside, we locked every door and window before collapsing against the wall in horror. Desperate for help, I dialed 911 again and stammered breathlessly through our dire situation. Just as I finished my frantic account, a horrifying realization dawned. We hadn't seen the creature retreat or die since we'd run into the cabin. It must still be out there. With no time to waste, Mike formulated a plan. He tried to lure the beast away while I remained hidden in the cabin. Don't you dare come out until help arrives, he whispered fiercely. Tears sprang involuntarily to my eyes as I embraced him in a gratitude-filled farewell. He disappeared into the night. For what felt like an eternity, I cowered in a small cupboard, clutching my phone tightly as beads of sweat gathered on my forehead. Every branch creaked outside, and every gust of wind filled me with renewed terror. Then came another gut-wrenching snarl and Mike's anguished screams. Heart pounding in my throat, I refused to leave my hiding place. Tears streamed down my face at the thought of what might be happening outside. As suddenly as it had begun, silence cloaked the cabin once more. The door finally crashed open minutes later, and responders flooded in after having received my out-of-breath plea for help. Sobbing with relief and fear at their sight, 
I threw open the dark cupboard's doors and rushed to them. Their search, however, yielded no sign of either Mike or the creature. The only clue, horrifically, was the growing pool of red trickling from the nearby woodland. But even as every instinct screamed at me to flee, I couldn't bring myself to abandon my brother. The authorities tried to piece together our nightmare. A tracker found Mike's battered knife. The blade was stained with a foul-smelling substance, black and viscous like tar. Whatever that creature had been, it definitely wasn't human. Intensive searching over the next few days revealed no more clues or sightings of both Mike and the beast. The forest felt darker and colder now, with a foreboding presence tainting every step I took within it. The evening we were set to leave, I stood on the porch, gazing ruefully at those boundless woods one last time. Guilt weighed heavily on my heart as sadness settled into my soul. And then, abruptly, it came, a low whisper snaking through the wind. I'll see you again. The careful mimicry of my brother's voice carried both malice and amusement in equal measure before dissolving into that unearthly snarl. Tears gave way to horror anew as the beast claimed us both in its cruel way. Even as I left these haunted woods behind, it would linger with me forevermore. You wouldn't believe this very realistic and logical story that I'm about to share with you. It all happened in a little town called Sedona, Arizona, during the early 2000s, when I was living there with my wife, Kelly. We lived in a cozy two-bedroom house near the edge of the Coconino National Forest. When I heard stories about the Red Owl YouTube channel, which features true crime and real-life horror stories, I knew I had to tell them mine. One day, Kelly and I went hiking in the forest with our dog, Spencer. As we hiked deeper into the woods, we came across a group of people who were trying to get a better view of some strange tracks on the ground. They appeared to be paw prints but were much larger than any normal animals. Despite being skeptical and finding it hard to believe that they belonged to anything nefarious, we couldn't help but feel a little uneasy as we continued our hike. As dusk approached, we made our way back towards our little house. We couldn't help but notice that those strange tracks seemed to appear more frequently along our path. As we continued through the darkening woods, we heard rustling noises behind us. After an adrenaline-free moment of unease, Spencer barked out a low, warning growl as he stared off beyond my right shoulder. Suddenly and unexpectedly, an enormous door slammed shut nearby with a reverberating echo that shook my chest. Peering beyond Spencer's perked ears, I saw what looked like an enormous figure darting behind some trees. The lumbering mass gave off a somewhat human-like quality at first glance, but when I focused on its movement and posture, it became apparent that this creature was anything other than human. Did you see that? I whispered to Kelly in disbelief as my heartbeat punched hard against my ribcage. What the hell was that? She asked. I shook my head, unable to answer. We all cautiously continued towards our home, trying to make sense of the situation. But as we came closer to the safety of the cozy house, my disbelief became anchored in fear when we encountered a putrid smell lingering in the air, the stench of something rotting and rank. The smell was so pungent that it caused dizziness that left me stumbling. That's when Spencer started whimpering, tucking his tail between his legs and inching himself to Kelly's side, clearly distressed by what he sensed nearby. I quickly scanned our surroundings, Finally catching sight of it, a massive figure with thick clawed hands and legs covered in coarse fur. 
Its eyes shimmered with an unnatural intensity that sent a jolt of terror down my spine. What do you want? I shouted out, trying to sound more confident than I felt. Kelly gripped my arm with shaking hands as we prepared for whatever might happen next. To our astonishment, the hulking figure simply stared at us for a moment before turning back into the darkness of the forest without a word. In our rush back to the house, we met Jim Edwards, an old neighbor who had lived in Sedona for over three decades. After avoiding most details about our encounter with this unknown creature, Jim's light-hearted response managed to calm our nerves, but only for the time being. Jim chuckled at our frightened expressions and said with a smile, Don't worry about it. Happens every now and then around these parts. We couldn't help but feel relief upon hearing this. Surely, it would be all right if Jim thought it wasn't worth worrying about. Then again, with all this unusual activity happening around us, should we really have been comforted? Questions weighed heavily on our minds. Weeks went by without incident until one evening after midnight, when the distant and gut-wrenching howls woke us. There was a fear in those creature-triggered sounds that made us feel hunted, even within our home. On that night, we never successfully rid ourselves of the volatile feeling gripping our guts. Who, or rather, what, was that thing we encountered that unsettling evening in the woods? Was it merely a misidentified creature of some kind, a hoax perpetuated by a group of clever pranksters, or something much darker and more insidious? The answer remained shrouded in mystery until one day, when I bumped into an old man by pure coincidence while grabbing my mail. He introduced himself as George. I continued to chat with George, the old man, who seemed very familiar with the strange happenings in our town. He mentioned that he had seen some peculiar things in his time but refused to share any specifics, stating that it was better not to know some things. As a few days passed, Kelly and I focused on our daily routine, trying to forget our spine-chilling encounter with the mysterious creature. But there was a distinctive change in the atmosphere around us. It felt heavier and more ominous than before. Spencer showed signs of distress as well. He'd often whine or bark at random times during both the day and night. One evening, around 9 p.m., Another blood-curdling scream echoed through the air. Its guttural tone filled us with unmistakable dread. It was then that we saw it, mutilated animal carcasses strewn all over our property. The sight was horrifying. Gore dripped from the bodies, and organs ripped from their cavities. The smell alone was enough to make you want to vomit. As we tried to process the gruesome scene before us, we saw Jim from across the way, staring at us with a sober expression. He shot an intense look at me before swiftly walking away without a word. Confused and scared out of our minds, Kelly and I decided that we had no choice but to evacuate immediately. We packed what belongings we could into our car and drove off into the night, fearful for our lives. As we were leaving Sedona city limits, I glanced back only to be mortified by what I saw. The hulking figure from before stood silhouetted under a streetlight. Its monstrous figure towered above everything else around it. Sleep did not come easy that night as we sought refuge in a nearby motel. A sense of uncertainty clouded over us as we tried to comprehend what just happened. We knew whatever this creature was, it wasn't going to stop until it had its fill of terror. We got a text from Jim the next day. His brief message sent chills down my spine. Be careful. You're not safe anywhere. With every passing night, we felt the creature's presence lurking nearby. It always seemed just out of sight, taunting us like a predator playing with its prey. Panic and paranoia started to consume our lives. 
As the days melded into one another, we formulated a plan. We couldn't continue living in fear and running away. We had to confront whatever this monster was, not fight it, but find a way to plead for mercy or bargain for our lives. On the third day, at precisely 3 p.m., we returned to our house, hoping to face the beast head-on. Armed with nothing but our desperate resolve, we stood in front of where the carnage had once been. With pale faces and shaking voices, we called out to the creature. To our surprise and terror, it obliged. Emerging from behind the trees, the creature revealed itself in all its grotesque glory. Its hulking frame was covered in matted fur mixed with gore, and its limbs stretched and bent at unnatural angles like some malformed beast from hell. On its skeletal face sat two deep-set eyes that glowed with a menacing light, while every nerve within me screamed for us to turn and run for our lives, Kelly and I stood our ground as I spoke up. Please spare us. We don't know why you're doing this, but we just want to live. A tense silence followed my plea before I heard its voice, distorted and guttural, sinking deep into my bones. Leave. Never return. With that concluding demand, it vanished back into the woods as quickly as it had appeared. Kelly and I hastily agreed never to set foot near Sedona again. We left everything behind, except for our lives and a story that those who heard it would never believe. It's been years since that terrifying encounter, and we've tried our best to move on from our trauma. We don't know what the creature was or why it tormented us, but every time I catch a whiff of something foul or hear strange, guttural noises in the night, I can't help but shudder at the possibility that it's still lurking out there somewhere, waiting. My morning routine was interrupted by a knock on the door. I rarely get visitors, especially this early in the day, and I don't precisely recall the specific date that it happened. Reluctantly, I opened it to find a young woman, a neighbor of mine, who asked if I had seen her dog since last night. Her hands were shaking slightly, and she explained that she had spent all night searching for her pet. I told her I hadn't seen anything but would keep an eye out. Then, she gratefully departed. Days turned into weeks without any sign of the missing dog. Despite being skeptical about the entire situation, several neighbors started sharing their stories about strange occurrences they had been noticing lately. Late night howls and yelps echoing through the woods behind our homes were among the top concerns. One evening, after work, I decided to take a walk through those woods to clear my head. The sun was setting amidst a tapestry of purples and oranges when something caught my eye, a mangled mess of fur lying on the ground. Upon closer inspection, I recognized it as my neighbor's missing dog. It lay decimated, its limbs ravaged and twisted unnaturally, and claw marks covered its lifeless body. I felt sick to my stomach as unease crept over me. When another neighbor's cat disappeared a few weeks later in similar circumstances, we couldn't ignore it any longer. The community began nightly patrols around the neighborhood without much success. One damp and cloudy night during my shift on patrol duty with a fellow skeptic named Larry, we heard crashing sounds in the foliage just ahead of us. We decided to investigate cautiously. We spotted a colossal figure shrouded in darkness. As we squinted alongside our dim flashlight beams, trying to make sense of what was before us, it lunged at us with supernatural speed. Over seven feet tall with elongated limbs, this ferocious beast resembled nothing we had ever seen before. Covered in coarse fur, with a wolf-like head and razor-sharp claws, it snarled at us, 
saliva dripping from its blood-stained maw. Terrified, we turned to flee from the monster as it landed a blow, paying little regard to our panic-stricken state. It effortlessly knocked Larry away several feet, landing in the underbrush with a bone-crunching thud. I stumbled over roots and muddy ground as adrenaline pumped through my veins. Panic took its toll on my senses as pain erupted in my side when I tripped over something hidden beneath the leaf litter. The creature circled around me, lunging suddenly and ripping into my left arm with its gnashing teeth. Blood seeped into the soil, staining it as I howled with agony. I knew I was about to meet my end. Suddenly there was an ear-shattering crash of branches and foliage behind the creature. Unsure if some mysterious hunter or something even more sinister was entering the fray, we both froze for a moment, allowing me a brief respite. The immense, shadowy figure whipped its head around to face the unknown source of disturbance before clambering into the thick underbrush at an alarming speed without making another sound. Wounded and shell-shocked, I crawled towards Larry and found him bruised but breathing. We managed to support each other back to a nearby house to call for help. Our encounter was not well received by local authorities. They skeptically praised us for our story, but suggested we may have met an escaped convict or perhaps another angry neighbor who had taken matters into their own hands. The incident with the creature left me with a relentless sense of dread that persisted throughout the following days. With Larry and I having barely managed to escape our encounter with the monstrous creature, fear took a firm grip on our neighborhood. In the wake of our horrifying experience, people became increasingly paranoid and desperate for answers. Late-night conversations among neighbors led to wild speculations about the identity of the beast we had encountered in the woods. Noticing how my own traumatic experience was affecting my community, I decided it was time to seek out help from someone knowledgeable about wildlife and local legends. After making some phone calls, I eventually got in touch with Dr. Susan Burke, a renowned expert in tracking and identifying obscure animal species. I met with Dr. Burke one cold morning at a nearby diner to discuss my recent encounter with the wolf-like creature. She listened intently as I described in detail my harrowing encounter and the state of the mutilated pets found amidst the woods. One thing is certain, this is no ordinary animal she said sternly after taking a moment to digest my story. The way it attacked you, you were lucky to escape alive. But it got frightened by something, which is strange. Animals like these are fearless when cornered. I know, I quietly responded, still shaken by what had happened on that fateful day. Do you have any idea as to what could have caused such an animal to suddenly freeze and retreat like that? Dr. Burke pondered for a moment before saying, It's unclear at this point. There may be another predator in the area that could have caused fear or extreme caution, something we don't yet understand. She then motioned for us to leave the diner, suggesting we visit the site where Larry and I had our close call. Upon arriving at the site of our battle against the beast, Dr. Burke conducted a thorough examination of both its claw marks and paw prints. As she analyzed the evidence before her, her face contorted into an expression of puzzlement. I've never seen anything like this, she admitted with a stunned look on her face. The prints and the marks on the ground, these are unlike any known animal. In that moment, the sound of rustling bushes sent a chill down my spine, causing me to freeze in terror. Dr. Burke instinctively grabbed my arm and whispered, Quick, we need to get out of here. It knows we're here. As we attempted to leave the scene, we stumbled upon a man sporting a bloody jacket who appeared on the edge of consciousness as he leaned against a weathered tree. 
Dr. Burke grabbed her medical supplies from the car and began administering first aid while I dialed for paramedics. W, what happened? He stammered through gritted teeth as he clung to life before passing out. The brave stranger had ventured deep into the woods in search of the creature that had been terrorizing our community. He now paid the price for underestimating its ferocity. In the days that followed, our town prepared for an inevitable showdown against the monstrous beast. Dr. Burke enlisted local wildlife experts and hunters to track down and hopefully drive away whatever remained lurking in our woods. One evening, as residents nervously guarded their homes while an armed team pursued the creature, a deafening howl echoed throughout the darkness, signifying another life claimed by this nightmarish menace. Fed up with this reign of terror following our losses, I galvanized my fellow neighbors to devise traps and other countermeasures designed to ward off this relentless predator. The successive confrontations were tense and brutal, but ultimately drove off the terrifying monster from our midst. We were left with scars that would never heal, both physical and emotional, but ultimately emerged victorious against something beyond understanding. As life slowly returned to our once peaceful community, we knew the creature would forever haunt our dreams. No longer plagued by deadly nocturnal terror, we had proved our resilience and banded together in the face of pure horror. From that day on, our neighborhood stood united as one, knowing that although the creature may still lurk beyond the shadows of the world, it would never again succeed in tearing us apart. It all happened during my summer break from college. I was house-sitting for my aunt and uncle, who lived in a secluded area near the Chattahoochee National Forest in Georgia. The first few days were perfect. I had plenty of time to relax, read, and explore the scenic trails that surrounded their house. I knew something was off when the family dog, Rusty, began to act peculiar. Rusty was a massive Great Dane, with all the muscle and courage to match his size. Watching him cower behind me while I sat on the porch with a book was shocking, to say the least. This continued for two more days before I decided to figure out what had him so spooked. I took my uncle's shotgun with me just in case it was a rogue bear or an aggressive wolf causing trouble around the property. On my trip into the woods accompanied by Rusty, I stopped dead in my tracks when I noticed deep claw marks on tree trunks, carcasses with unnatural bite wounds, and an eerily quiet atmosphere. I'd been hunting many times before, yet something about this situation made me uneasy. As we ventured further into the forest, I noticed that these strange things seemed to be increasing in frequency and severity. It wasn't until we came across a shredded deer carcass hanging from a tree too high for any normal predator to reach that Rusty let out a fierce growl. In an instant, Rusty bolted away from me down another path. Before I could react, he disappeared entirely from sight, leaving me alone in some seriously unpleasant surroundings. Panicking slightly but determined to find him, I cautiously followed Rusty's barking echoing through the woods. When I finally caught up with him at the edge of a clearing, I saw something straight out of my darkest nightmares waiting there, a massive creature covered in matted fur towering over even Rusty's large frame. Its head looked wolf-like, but its body was more human, like some twisted version of merging man and beast. The most disturbing aspect of the creature was its piercing yellow eyes, which seemed to see right through me. I can't adequately express the fear that took hold when it turned those haunting eyes upon me, snarling and drooling with impatience. Without hesitation, I raised my shotgun and fired three rounds into the monstrous being. 
As it roared in pain, Rusty and I retreated deeper into the woods. We managed to lose it and make it home just as the sun was going down. As we sat huddled together on my aunt and uncle's porch, I called their number, urgently pleading for them to return as soon as possible. A couple of days later they arrived back, finding a terrified man trying to rationalize his nightmare encounter with an unbelievable creature. My uncle didn't seem overly concerned with this story. He had his own theories about the forest's enigmatic residence. When he called some of his buddies with whom he shared these theories, they confirmed that there had been sightings of similar creatures, werewolves, or otherwise known as dog men in this region for generations. In time, whispers of my experience spread around their small community, which eventually reached Andrew, a bartender at the local watering hole. That same night I couldn't sleep. The haunting image of the monstrous creature was etched in my memory, causing shivers to run through me. Choosing to fight through the fear, I stayed awake, keeping an eye on Rusty and waiting for any sign that something else might be hiding out there in the dark. The next morning began with bright sunlight streaming into the house, a sharp contrast to the terrifying ordeal I had experienced the day before. When it was time to venture out for another look around, my uncle insisted he would come along with his hunting rifle. As we stepped out of the house into the already hot day, Rusty seemed a little more at ease than before. With caution and determination, we made our way back to the spot where I had encountered the gruesome beast. Along the trail, I shared more details about yesterday's events with my uncle. He remained mostly silent but stayed vigilant as we moved further into the forest. Finally, we reached the point where I last saw the creature. It seemed as untouched as it was when I stumbled across it last. Just as anxiety began to wrap its cold arms tightly around me again, my uncle held up his hand in a silent gesture for me to stop moving. His eyes scanned the surroundings before he quickly called out. Over there, he whispered urgently. I see something. I followed his gaze and saw a large patch of matted fur caught on some branches nearby. Beyond that lay some tracks, four-fingered prints that sank deep into the soil, leading away from our position. My uncle suggested we split up to follow different paths and find out where they led before meeting back at this spot within half an hour. Even though uneasy feelings nod at me like hungry wolves, I agreed. When it was time for us to actually part ways, though, every hair on my body stood on end in utter terror. My uncle noticed my distressed state and without hesitation, told me it was okay to follow him if I felt more comfortable doing so. Relief washed over me immediately as I stuck close to his side for our whole journey. The trail seemed to stretch on forever. As we silently trudged along, I couldn't help but feel as though something rotten was awaiting us with every step. What we didn't expect, however, was what awaited us at the end of this ominous path. A makeshift campsite covered in torn clothing and, to our horror, human remains surrounded the area. Partially gnawed bones lay scattered amongst the foliage, a macabre sight that made us both feel sick to our stomachs. One grisly aspect in particular stood out. Every skull had been cleanly severed near the spine, an intentional act with undeniable malice. Shifting his weight from one foot to another nervously, my uncle suggested that we head back immediately and contact the authorities. This wasn't a situation where exploring further would benefit anyone, especially considering the creature may still be in the vicinity. By the time we reached my aunt and uncle's home again, our heads buzzed with frantic energy. Each glance from one corner of the room to another came with the thought that an unstoppable force of nightmares lived too close for comfort. We knew life was never going to be, 
normal, again after discovering what lurked in those woods. As soon as my aunt and uncle informed local authorities of everything that had transpired and showed them photographic evidence taken during our trek, they agreed something unnatural was out there. Search parties were organized, but mere commoners stood no chance against a supernatural being hellbent on causing chaos and destruction while evading capture. I was left feeling relieved once I was brought back into civilization. But even then I remained haunted, knowing that there is something lurking in George's forests that should simply not exist. Everything we thought was real had been shattered, and the world assumed an eerie glow, a constant reminder of the darkness hiding just beyond the curtain of reality. Now, years later, I still remember the creature and what it did to those unsuspecting victims. Even though it's never been killed or captured, whispers of its existence persist as a dark specter hovers over the little town that faces this hidden evil. Those yellow eyes remain etched in my memory, silently watching as people attempt to move on with their lives, chasing shadows while the monster remains free and unstoppable. I've always been a fan of road trips, and my favorite time to drive is during the twilight hours. There's nothing like the first tinges of morning light creeping across the sky as it scorches away the darkness of night, leaving you to witness the birth of a new day. Little did I know that one such road trip would change my life forever. It must have been around 3 a.m. when I decided to pull over for a break. The highway was fairly desolate, so I pulled onto a rural exit and parked in front of an old diner that clearly hadn't been open in years. Just as I got out to stretch my legs and take in some fresh air, I heard someone call out from behind me. Hey stranger, said an elderly man sitting on the steps of the closed diner. You shouldn't be around here at this time. His words struck me as odd. But I didn't think much of it at first and figured he was just some homeless guy who hung around these parts. But there was something in his eyes that gave off a genuine concern. Why? I asked, curious about what he meant. He hesitated for a moment before replying. Something lurks in these woods when the moon's still out. Folks who've seen it, well, they don't come back quite right. My skeptical side entertained his warning with a raised eyebrow as he continued. Some say it's a werewolf or dogman or something unnatural like that. The corners of my mouth twitched into a smile, trying to suppress laughter at his far-fetched story. But despite my skepticism, an unexplainable chill ran through me. I thanked him for his advice but told him I really needed to get going since there was still quite some distance to cover on my journey. As I drove further along the winding road through the dense forest, I couldn't help but feel a faint twinge of anxiety that I brushed off as my imagination playing tricks on me. That's when I noticed the dense fog swallowing the trees like some sinister force the atmosphere rapidly changing from eerie to downright unsettling. I was about to light a cigarette to calm my nerves when my heart jumped in my chest as a gut-wrenching howl echoed through the trees, drowning out the hum of my engine. Moments later, impossibly huge paw prints appeared on the foggy road ahead of me, as if materializing from thin air. In that moment, something snapped inside me. Rational thought was replaced with pure survival instincts. I floored the gas pedal without thinking, desperate to escape the monstrous creature I couldn't even see but knew instinctually was hunting me. The howls grew more menacing and persistent as the unseen creature closed in on my speeding car. It was then that I saw it, or rather they. Three colossal creatures blurred between wolf and man 
with unruly patches of dark hair covering every inch of their muscular forms, lunged dangerously close to my car, their eyes glinting red like hellish embers against the backdrop of fog and darkness. As I raced through the winding roads surrounded by seemingly sentient fog and grotesque creatures seemingly straight out of a horror movie, a horrifying thought struck me. What if what lies beyond this mist is even more terrifying than what lies within? My heart thudded vigorously in my chest as one of those abominations leaped toward me with vicious intent, only to be foiled by losing its balance and crashing into its counterpart. It appeared for a fleeting moment that they too were being pursued by something larger, something more sinister than even themselves. The creatures split in different directions as their prey seemed to vanish into the thick fog, hunting it relentlessly without second thoughts or fears for their own safety. As I continued speeding down the foggy road, desperate to escape whatever nightmare was lurking in the woods, I realized that I had a decision to make, find a way out of this hellish situation or face certain doom. With the monstrous creatures and their prey now out of sight, I could no longer pretend that this was just some twisted trick of my imagination. These were real horrors hunting me through the darkness, and I needed to come up with a way to survive. It was then that I recalled passing by an old gas station with a small auto body shop attached. An idea formed in my mind. Maybe there were tools and supplies there I could use to defend myself. The hope of finding even the slightest shred of protection gave me a renewed sense of urgency as I raced back to where I'd first encountered the creatures. Upon reaching the dilapidated garage, I parked my car as far away from the road as possible so that it wouldn't be seen easily if they returned. As I rummaged through the disarrayed workspace, it became evident that it hadn't been used for quite some time. Metal shavings littered the floor, and rusted out tools coated with grime lay strewn about. Luckily, I discovered a nail gun with a full gas canister and an assortment of nails beside it. A makeshift weapon would have to suffice. Cautiously venturing outside again, my eyes nervously scanned the area for any sign of those heinous beasts. Time seemed to crawl at an unbearable pace as I waited for their return. Every rustle in the wind or distant howl sent jolts of fear shooting through me, causing beads of sweat to run down my face. It wasn't until around dawn when that eerie silence broke. Bounding through the tree lean came one of those nightmarish creatures in terrifying pursuit of its prey. Hoping not to draw too much attention, I held my breath as I took aim with the nail gun. The creature was mere feet away when my finger squeezed the trigger, sending nails flying through the air and embedding themselves into its hulking form. The foul beast let out a blood-curdling scream and fell to the ground, writhing in pain. For once, feeling like I'd turned the tides in my favor, I prepared to end it when, out of nowhere, its prey, a frail woman who seemed to have been running for her life, decided to intervene. Stop! she shouted, causing me to freeze in place. Don't hurt it any more. It's not their fault. I was floored by her defense of these murderous monsters but remained cautious expecting the wounded creature to retaliate. Instead, through gritted teeth and immense pain, it whimpered a confirmation. She's right. We're just victims. As it happened, these creatures were once normal people who had encountered something far more sinister lurking within the woods, an ancient curse that transformed them against their will into the monstrous beasts that stood before me. It seemed that they retained some fragments of humanity despite their outward appearance. In those early morning hours, we formed a tenuous alliance and crafted a plan, find the source of this curse and break it together. Begrudgingly relying on each other in our shared quest for survival, 
we'd attempt to unravel the dark secret hidden at the heart of this fog-shrouded forest. We succeeded in breaking the curse after several gruesome encounters with unspeakable horrors along our treacherous journey. They regained their human forms, battered and scarred but undeniably grateful for our joint effort. Once human again, we parted ways, promising never to speak of those harrowing few days spent fighting side by side against an evil older than time itself. For me, though, as much as I tried, I couldn't forget the nightmarish experience, and I knew deep in my heart that whatever else was lurking in the shadows wouldn't remain hidden for long. I was driving from a weekend getaway in Maine, heading back to Boston. I'd stopped at a roadside diner somewhere deep in the woods of Massachusetts for a quick bite to eat. The waitress named Sheila had a wicked sense of humor, and we got to chatting over coffee before it spilled that she believed the area was haunted by some sort of supernatural creature. I'm serious, she said with a laugh. Ask anyone around here. They'll tell you stories about these creepy, man-dog hybrid things that roam the woods sometimes. Astonishingly enough, even the older regulars seemed to share her opinion, nodding silently as they sipped their black coffee. I chuckled nervously and finished my meal, dismissing their claims as nothing more than local lore. Back on the road again, Daylight disappeared faster than expected. I had driven this route back to Boston many times, but never at this time of night. The lonely stretch of highway was lined by an endless forest on either side, and fog slithered across the road like living tendrils. Suddenly, up ahead, I spotted something blocking my path, a tree that had fallen across the road during a recent storm. Initially annoyed at this unexpected inconvenience, I quickly realized with a shiver that the area where I happened to be stuck was eerily similar to those warned about by Sheila and her fellow patrons. Realizing there was no way forward without clearing the obstruction from my path, I drove onto the shoulder and cautiously stepped out of my car into the foggy darkness. As I moved closer to grapple with the downed tree, Something rustled in the nearby bushes, causing me to freeze mid-step. Fully alert now to every sound and tiny movement in the cold gloom around me, my heart pounding out of my chest as though it wanted desperately to flee this place far ahead of my body. A low growl echoed through gaps in my breathing, or was it my imagination? Then I heard movement again, this time closer and more deliberate. It was just a deer, I whispered to myself, though deep down I knew it wasn't. The moon provided little light in the night sky thanks to a blanket of discolored clouds. Glancing back at my car, I contemplated locking myself in. But the thought of sitting there like a personal buffet in a tin can for whatever was out here with me got rid of that idea. Gritting my teeth and gulping at the air in an attempt to settle my nerves, I closed the distance between myself and the tree once more. Every twist of twig underfoot made me worry that it drew attention from whatever shared this foggy space with me. As I pushed with all my strength against the massive tree trunk, my hands numb with cold and sweat stinging my eyes, a piercing howl broke through the quiet night air. The shock sent me tumbling back into a bush. From the woods slunk a hulking figure. It was bigger than any wolf or dog I'd ever seen. Muscles rippled beneath fur as black as the night sky, its eyes reflecting the moonlight like pools of molten silver. There we were, me and this beast, staring each other down as our breaths mingled with the perpetual fog surrounding us. In those eyes burned an intelligence that no animal should possess. The creature's lips curled back into a fiendish snarl, revealing dagger-like teeth, 
before it lunged toward me at a terrifying speed. Its claws dug into the damp earth, sending chunks of dirt and mud flying in every direction. I scrambled to my feet, my lungs burning as I gasped for air, and started running back towards my car. As I sprinted, I heard the gut-wrenching sounds of the creature tearing through the foliage behind me. The night air was filled with the stink of death and decay. Running for my life, my heart pounding in my ears, I nearly slipped on a patch of slick leaves as I reached the safety of my car. Fumbling with the door handle in a panic, I managed to open it just as the beast leaped out of the foliage. In one fluid motion, trying not to think about what awaited me just inches away, I threw myself into the driver's seat and slammed the door shut. My hands shook uncontrollably as I jammed the key into the ignition and turned it with all my might. The car's engine roared to life, and I peeled off the side of the road with tires screeching. As I sped away from that cursed spot in a cloud of dust and trailing exhaust fumes, I glanced in my rearview mirror. The creature stood motionless on the edge where pavement met wilderness, its silver eyes burning like twin pools of liquid fire. My pulse raced as I hit the gas pedal harder. An overwhelming desire to distance myself from that monster screamed within me louder than any voice could compete. The engine wailed beneath me as if urging me onward through sweat-streaked windshield vistas and moonlit shadows cast by towering trees. I'm not sure how long I continued driving back towards civilization without pause at dangerous speeds. But once dense New England forest had given way to suburbia's familiar embrace, Entrances to shopping centers passed under harsh orange lamps between unfamiliar neighborhoods. I finally began slowing down and shaking myself out of the grip that supernatural terror had on me. Days later, I shared my story with a friend visiting from out of town. At first, he looked skeptical, but something in my tone or my shaken demeanor silenced any hint of mockery. My aunt used to live around that area, he said quietly. She saw something like that years ago. She never could explain it. I never did revisit that stretch of road through the Massachusetts woods, and life went on as if nothing had ever happened. But each and every new tale shared in hushed conversations at dingy diners or whispered behind the thin walls dividing apartment complexes kept me tethered to the memory of that inhuman monstrosity lurking within the midnight fog. Did it continue to stalk its darkened lair, preying on unfortunate travelers who found themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time? Or had it faded back into the shadows? a ghostly figment better left undiscovered? I wondered about this during sleepless nights and quiet moments when I found myself alone with nothing but my thoughts and unanswered questions. One thing was certain, some mysteries are simply not meant to be understood. It was the hottest July we'd had in years. I swear, you could fry an egg on the sidewalk. I'd hopped on my bike after work, craving a cold beer and maybe a burger from the new place that just opened up downtown. I had a fair idea of who was working tonight. It was Jenny's shift, and she was always good for a sassy remark and a laugh. Riding through the outskirts of town, I took my usual shortcut through an isolated area where only a few houses lined the road. It was usually pretty quiet here, which gave me time to clear my head after a long day. As I pedaled through, however, I noticed Mr. Jenkins standing outside his house, looking fearful, with a rifle hanging off his shoulder. He was usually the friendly, chatty type. Hey there, Rob. Be real careful cycling home tonight, 
he advised solemnly as he glanced at the thick woods that lined his property. Why is that? Did something happen? I asked him, curious but not too alarmed. Mr. Jenkins always had wild stories to share when he'd had one too many iced teas. He hesitated before answering. Someone's been killing animals around here. The fear in his eyes was unsettling. I eyed him cautiously and replied, Well, stay safe then. With that, I continued my ride to the bar and put it out of my mind for the rest of the night. With a full stomach and feeling lighter from a couple of beers later in the evening, I decided it was time to head home. However, as soon as I exited the bar, dread washed over me as I realized how dark and silent it had gotten outside. Throngs of fluttering bats above me seemed more menacing than usual. I hopped back on my bike and began pedaling home faster than before when suddenly something rustled in the woods near Mr. Jenkins' property. On high alert given the earlier conversation, I watched the bushes quiver as something big moved in them. Panicking, I rode even faster, but out of nowhere, a massive figure ambushed me, an enormous, wolf-like creature on two legs. It lunged at me with bloodshot eyes and massive claws, ready to slash. Narrowly dodging its attack, I lost balance and tumbled off my bike. I hurriedly scrambled to get up and sprinted without looking back at the monstrosity that was surely stalking me. In my panic-stricken state, I had run far from my usual route and found myself lost on a quiet road with no signs of life or help around. Out of breath and barely keeping my legs steady underneath me, I sporadically heard growls and snarls from behind me. The creature seemed to be toying with me as it stalked its prey. It took everything in me to brace myself against the all-consuming terror and fight back the urge to just lie down and submit to this relentless predator. All that was achieved by buying me a few precious seconds before lunging from an old oak tree was sheer animalistic desperation. Clinging for dear life on one of its branches, I looked down and saw the monstrous abomination circling below me while gnashing its teeth together menacingly. By sheer luck or divine intervention, headlights began to approach from a distance. The creature, seemingly taken aback by this sudden interruption, hesitated briefly before disappearing into the shadows again. The car approached, revealing itself as a sheriff's cruiser patrolling the area. Are you all right there, son? He shouted out while giving me a concerned look. I couldn't believe my luck when he pulled over to let me in. With his help and still in disbelief over what had happened tonight, we managed to pick up my battered bike, waiting silently next to my blood-streaked phone lying by the side of the road. This confirmed that I hadn't imagined everything and that the nightmare I had just faced was very real. When news got around and conversations about the event took place, people would talk with furrowed brows and horrified fascination. Some attempted to rationalize it away, speculating we had mutated coyotes prowling around us, but I knew better. And so did Mr. Jenkins, who simply leaned back in his chair with every conversation that passed him by and took another sip of his whiskey. As I sat, feverishly spilling the horrifying events of that night to the sheriff, he seemed to grow quieter and more concerned with each passing detail. He had been looking into the recent string of animal killings and said there was something unusual about the methods, or rather, about the lack of them. It seemed less like the work of hunters or poachers and more like a sick game with no rhyme or reason. The next couple of days felt like walking on a knife's edge. The town itself seemed on high alert, with an uneasy stillness hanging in the air. People whispered in hushed tones about strange sightings and sounds on the outskirts of town. Yet, at the same time, life went on as it always had. People still commuted to and from work, 
and kids continued playing outside. I confided in Jenny at the bar, who listened with wide-eyed disbelief before shaking her head solemnly. This has got to stop, Rob, she said emphatically. We can't live in terror like this. Two days after my encounter with the beast, people were growing bolder. Armed with rifles and flashlights, groups of neighbors volunteered to patrol around town during the night hours in hopes of catching a glimpse of whatever horror haunted our streets. The patrols worked around the clock but found nothing unusual except for an eerie silence that blanketed our town. Three days after my run-in with the beast, I received a call from Sheriff Dalton asking me to come down to his office. Once inside his office, Sheriff Dalton pulled out several torn-up animal carcasses from an evidence bag and laid them carefully on his desk. Layers of fear etched across my face as I immediately recognized these animals as those belonging to my fellow townsfolk, pets that had been missing for days. I found these just outside Mr. Jenkins's property, he explained soberly. They were scattered about fifty yards into the woods. Suddenly, the impossible truth struck me like a bolt from the blue. You think, Mr. Jenkins? I stammered, the implications of what I was about to say hanging heavily in the suddenly too small room. The sheriff nodded gravely. I'm afraid I do. I've found some other evidence pointing to him as well. He proceeded to show me photographs of claw marks on Mr. Jenkins's trees, but they were distinctly different from any bear or coyote tracks familiar to us. There's something more going on here, otherworldly or not, Dalton emphasized. On the fourth day after my life had turned into an ongoing nightmare, we apprehended Mr. Jenkins who went without resistance but swore up and down he was being framed. The townsfolk began to mobilize to hunt down the unknown menace among us. Just before dawn on that same night, our town awakened with a start to gut-wrenching screams echoing through the streets. Racing outside, we found a scene straight from a war zone, several lifeless bodies sprawled near the outskirts of town. Despite our best efforts, we still couldn't capture or kill this merciless antagonist stalking our community. We huddled together, helpless before this seemingly insurmountable adversary. Soon after, many residents packed their belongings and fled town in a desperate bid for safety. Those few who stubbornly chose to stay imprisoned themselves behind locked doors and shuttered windows. Months have passed since that grisly night, yet every so often the mournful howl of something caught between this realm and another echoes through the remains of our once thriving community, an eerie reminder of what our lives have become. Time has tarnished memories, but one harrowing fact remains, something lethal still prowls these streets, hiding in plain sight among us. One time, I had to drive to this remote town for work. They called it Harmonyville. It was a quaint, small place tucked away in the woods. I quickly discovered that the locals in Harmonyville were real characters. The generation seemed to steep here like fine wine, each displaying a unique twist in upbringing and worldview. I spent my first day making my rounds, talking to different folks about upgrading their cable services. On one occasion, I met a local who went by the name of Old Man Collins. In between sharing his suspicions about government surveillance and showering me with sarcastic quips, he casually mentioned these bizarre occurrences that often happened at night. People's pets going missing, strange shrieks echoing through the woods and tales of horribly mangled animals being found on the outskirts of town. Old Collins was a hard nut to crack, a mix of conspiracy theorist and dark humorist whimsy, 
and while initially I assumed it was just the spooky ramblings of an eccentric elder, I couldn't help but notice the anxious undercurrent of our conversation. Something about these stories rattled me more than it should have. Later that night, I was walking from my car to the motel when distant rustling assaulted my ears. There was tension in the air, the kind you could twang like a guitar string. I hurried into my room and locked the door behind me. I tried to shake off the creeping feeling of paranoia from living in bigger cities. My sleep was rocky at best. Horrid dreams plagued me throughout the night. The next morning, while eating breakfast at the local diner with some old-timers, they all shared their unique encounters with this ominous, unseen force roaming Harmonyville. Each person recounted experiences coated with chilling dread, a J.E.N.E. Sayus qua that whispered malignance. Radio static interrupted their discussion. The morning news broadcast was reporting yet another case of a mutilated deer found on someone's property across town. The silence hung heavy, the air tense and ominous as the men traded grim glances. In that moment, I truly felt the abnormal atmosphere thrumming throughout Harmonyville. The dread soaked into my bones, and I couldn't shake off the nagging feeling that I was being watched. Late that afternoon, when I was walking back to my motel room after another long day of work, a piercing scream shattered the calm air. The deranged sound penetrated me like a serrated dagger, leaving me trembling on the spot while people rushed outside in panicked confusion. My alarm turned to disgust when we found a mutilated raccoon on the edge of town. However, this time, there were unnatural claw marks right beside the remains. Something vicious had been at work here, something beyond what any local wildlife could have done. The sun dipped below the horizon, and darkness fell that night as I sat with some locals in front of old man Colin's house. We were sharing stories about what could be out there when an unearthly growl echoed through the trees, directly behind us. Before we knew it, an enormous creature leapt from the shadows, landing just inches away from us. Matted fur covered its muscular frame, and its elongated limbs adorned with spine-chilling claws left us paralyzed with terror as it snarled menacingly at our petrified faces. What in God's name? One local sputtered before panic-induced caves erupted around me. Divine mercy seemed lost on us as we scrambled for safety while the monstrosity lunged forward with horrifying speed. In utter panic and disbelief, I bolted toward my car and fumbled with my keys as I watched my neighbors flee in every direction, horror etched on their faces as they ran from certain death. I managed to unlock my car and jumped in just as the creature's monstrous moss slammed against my car window. The nauseating stench of rot flooded the air as its twisted face smashed against the glass, its grotesque eyes meeting mine full of fury and malevolence. I started the engine and floored the accelerator, narrowly swerving past the beast as it tore at my car door with a rending screech. As I sped through Harmonyville, desperate to escape, I caught glimpses of people cowering inside their homes. The overwhelming oppression that had infested this town was now visible on every face I passed. I screeched to a halt outside the local police station. Breathless and panicked, I burst through the doors and pleaded for help with the formidable terror that had been unleashed upon our community. Do something, please! I cried out to Sheriff Paulson, a hardened man who rarely looked phased by anything. To see him look as pale and concerned as he did now only served to heighten my fear. People are dying. That thing is out there. He nodded gravely and led me back to his office, calling officers in and sharing the horrifying news. Within hours, search parties had been assembled, armed with rifles. But something nagged at me, 
what weapons could effectively fight a creature like this? As we marched into the woods at dusk, moonlight cut through the tree's gnarled branches like ghostly fingers. We were about to encounter something far beyond human comprehension, an abomination best hidden amongst nightmares. Amidst hushed whispers and hoarse prayers for protection, we stumbled upon the creature's first victim of this terrifying night. The sight was harrowing, mangled limbs contorted into unnatural angles, blood soaking into the loamy ground beneath us. It moved beyond us with unthinkable speed, striking down officers in a grotesque whirlwind of violence. Howls of despair and cries for help punctured the disquietude, but it was no use. Bloodied claw marks littered the night like grotesque graffiti. As we attempted to regroup, the unthinkable happened. The creature suddenly stopped its rampage and stared at us with a primal intelligence that sent ice coursing through my veins. A relentless presence, twisted by an insatiable appetite for destruction. The survivors and I exchanged apprehensive glances as we shakily backed away. The beast lowered its gaze, studying the ground with undeniable intent before fixating back on us with a predatory hunger. Retreat! Sheriff Paulson's voice cracked like an explosion as we scattered in a frenzy, all the while stalked by the nightmarish monster. In moments, our team had been eviscerated to nothing more than ragged remnants of souls lost, a terror too gruesome to adequately describe. The following days saw Harmonyville under siege from this vicious perpetrator. Trapped in our homes, our sleep was plagued by endless panic. Fear became as tangible as air. A suffocating malevolence that choked hope from every breath we drew. But eventually, and unexplained by our own desire to survive, a morning dawned without further deaths or attacks. The creature appeared to have vanished, as suddenly and inexplicably as it had appeared. Solemn morning drenched the streets of Harmonyville. Lives lost could never be replaced or forgotten. And though relief swept over myself and the now beast-ridden town, somehow I could sense that whatever diabolical darkness the creature had been drawn from was still watching us. Another week passed without incident and I cautiously prepared to leave Harmonyville. Yet amidst tearful farewells from shaken residents, an uncomfortable truth clung to my soul. Would this horror ever truly be contained? As I exited Harmonyville's ill-fated boundaries, swallowed by dense foliage and entangled branches, a silent and chilling parting gift awaited my departure. In the rear mirror of my car, Seemingly miles away from where the creature had hurled its wrath, I glimpsed it again, watching, waiting. From that day forward, I vowed never to return to Harmonyville. And despite desperate attempts to extinguish memories of that petrifying encounter, the last glimpse of that monstrous creature forever haunts me, a lurking reminder of a nefarious malevolence always lying in wait ready to strike. It all began on my 32nd birthday, when I decided to take a weekend trip to the Catskill Mountains with some friends. We rented a rustic cabin nestled in a dense forest that made for the perfect escape from the city. I had invited Tom who was a seasoned skeptic, and Samantha, who loved cracking jokes. We were the perfect combination of personalities for an adventure. As we settled into the cabin, Tom couldn't resist poking fun at my decision to choose an isolated location for our get-together. I mean, think about it. What could possibly go wrong on a remote mountainside with no cell reception? It's almost like being in a low-budget suspense movie. Sam chimed in with a smirk. 
Or maybe it's just your hidden fear of experiencing anything beyond your precious gadgets. I laughed along, soaking up the banter and enjoying the change in pace. As darkness fell, we decided to light a bonfire and roast marshmallows. While huddled around the crackling pit, Tom alluded to some campfire tales he had heard about strange creatures supposedly prowling in the nearby woods. Sam dismissed them as folkloric nonsense immediately. Yeah, right, just some weirdos dressed up like Bigfoot trying to scare away tourists, she said sarcastically. The next day, we started on an adventurous hike through the scenic Catskill Trails. As we trekked, I suddenly realized how much I missed this sort of connection with nature. It was all too easy to get caught up in city life's hectic pace. Resting near a small creek, we greedily gulped water from our bottles and devoured snacks from our packs. Sunlight filtered through the green canopy overhead as our jovial conversation continued uninterrupted. As dusk started to settle in later that evening, we found ourselves nearing the end of our trek when we crossed paths with an elderly lady named Edna who lived nearby. She warned us about some odd occurrences in the area, and of course, Tom and Sam brushed her off without hesitation. Feeling a little uneasy now, I decided to humor Edna and ask for more information. With genuine concern in her eyes, Edna explained that some locals had claimed to have seen terrifying creatures. She described them as lean, feral-looking beings, reminiscent of werewolves or dogmen from old stories but far more human-like. The mention of werewolves almost made Sam's eyeball roll off her head. Okay, sure, she said with mock sincerity. We'll be extra cautious. Edna nodded solemnly despite the obvious sarcasm and proceeded on her way. That night's bonfire was notably more subdued. Although Tom and Sam maintained their skepticism, Edna's words undeniably left a mark on me. Despite the uneasiness that had settled over us, we managed to finish our hike without further incident and return to the cabin. Tom and Sam seemed more engrossed in their conversations, acting as if Edna's words had never left an impact, but I couldn't shake off the feeling of dread that her warning had left behind. I busied myself by preparing dinner for the three of us, trying to distract myself from the eerie feeling. On our final day in the Catskills, we spent the morning fishing by the creek. It was around 11.30 a.m. when I felt something watching me from a distance. The hairs on my neck stood upright as I glanced around at our surroundings. My eyes caught a glimpse of something almost human in appearance but twisted and grotesque standing near the edge of the woods. Its skin was a mottled grayish blue with patches of sparse hair on its arms and legs and long limbs that seemed to bend at unnatural angles protruded from its sinewy frame. It was humanoid but hunched over as if it had never learned to stand upright. Its face resembled both canine and human traits while appearing either at the same time. Wide, unblinking eyes peered out between distorted features. Sharp teeth were visible through a gruesome sneer. I stifled a scream catching my breath before I cautiously whispered to Tom and Sam, Guys, you need to see this. Their laughter ceased abruptly as they followed my gaze and discovered what I was looking at. Nobody dared move or make eye contact with this abomination. The creature shuddered briefly, releasing a horrible sound, something akin to a wailing sob peppered with guttural clicks before it disappeared back into the dense forest from whence it came. We clutched on to one another, unable to tear our eyes away from the spot where it vanished. With adrenaline surging through our veins, we quickly packed up our belongings and moved cautiously away from the creek. Nobody said a word. Our previous jovial tone had been replaced by a heavy silence. Earlier, 
I vaguely remembered Edna mentioning a ranger station just a mile from the cabin. We agreed that we should seek help and report the incident there. The clock read 1.15 p.m. as we sped up the trail to the ranger station, glancing behind us every few steps to make sure we weren't being pursued. Upon reaching the station, we explained our encounter to the ranger on duty in explicit detail. He listened solemnly, taking notes on our descriptions. I've heard stories of this creature, he said gravely, his face pale. We don't have an official name for it. It's something beyond our understanding. But it's been described by several other hikers over the years. Terrified, we pleaded with him to escort us back to the cabin so that we could grab our belongings and leave immediately. He agreed and accompanied us as we hastily collected our things. As the sun began to dip towards the horizon at around 7.45 p.m., we turned to leave the cabin behind with unshakable memories of our trip. The ranger informed us that they would be investigating further into our report before bidding us farewell. The three of us drove away in silence, unable to shake off our heavy hearts burdened by what we had seen in those woods, a grotesque nightmare come true. Even now, when I close my eyes at night, I can still see its haunting face staring back at me, a twisted and horrific image ingrained into my mind forevermore. But perhaps most disturbing of all is that even after days of searching and investigations done by the rangers after our incident was reported, no evidence of such a creature was found, nor was there any sign of where it may have gone. It remains a nightmarish enigma a gruesome and terrifying mystery that haunts both the Catskill Mountains and our memories, lurking in the dark depths of the unknown. It was a Friday night like any other. I was hanging out with my buddies at our local bar in Crescent City, California. We were all joking around, having a couple of beers, and had completely lost track of time. Eventually, everyone began heading off, and I realized it was well past midnight when I finally started making my way home. There's just something about seeing all those happy faces that always makes me lose track of time. As I strolled through the quiet streets, I heard some commotion coming from one of the nearby alleys. At first, I ignored it, figuring it would be some wild raccoons rummaging through the trash cans or a stray dog scrounging for food. But as I continued walking, the noise got louder and more distinct, a mix of gut-wrenching snarls and piercing screams that didn't sound like anything I'd ever heard before. Curiosity got the better of me so I decided to take a peek into the alley where the noise was coming from. As soon as I entered the dimly lit space between buildings, a putrid smell assaulted my nostrils, causing me to gag involuntarily. The repugnant odor only added to the eeriness of the situation. Pressing on through my revulsion, I slowly rounded the corner and found myself looking at a scene straight from a horror movie. There was blood splattered everywhere, broken glass scattered across the floor, and what looked like claw marks gouged into the brick walls. In the center of it all lay a dismembered corpse mid-torn apart, an older man who frequented the bar with us. My heart gripped by fear and my wits numbly shocked, my gaze locked onto whatever had just savagely ripped apart my bar buddy, a massive beast its bulk barely contained within the shadows that cast eerie flickers across its unseen face. Now, if I were to tell you this thing looked like a dog crossed with a gorilla, that would honestly be the understatement of the century. This monstrosity had matted brown and black fur all over its muscular body, and its piercing yellow eyes held the malice that only a bloodthirsty predator could possess. Through quivering lips that could barely breathe, 
I tried to mutter something to alert my unknowing fellow pedestrians nearby. However, with each stifled syllable that tried to claw its way from my throat, this sinister creature stepped menacingly in cadence, warning me in a way that was far too human-like. Convinced now that I stood before an otherworldly creation sprouted from nightmares, I had no choice but to slowly back away, refusing to break eye contact in fear it might use the added distraction as provocation for inciting more gore. As terror drummed through my veins with each desperate pump of my racing heart, I ducked behind a corner and sprinted home like it was an Olympic decathlon. Once safe within my apartment's comforting confines, I locked all the doors and windows. The hairs on my neck refused to lay flat. Cold sweat continued prickling down my skin. Yet the burnished moonlight filtering through my window's slit held nothing but laughter for my situation. The next day, after our community learned of what happened during those midnight hours, folks spun tall tales about strange myths and bizarre folklore. Some say it was Bigfoot or a chupacabra staking a claim. Others joke that it must have been a werewolf or dogman from ancient stories masquerading among us. What intrigues me more than wild conjectures is how none of these skeptics can explain away one presumably drunk man's mysterious massacre. It's been several days since anyone caught wind of that hellish beast's existence, and yet I still find myself wondering about that fateful night. Summoning courage that should have belonged to another lifetime, I called up the YouTube channel Red Owl to share my story thinking maybe they harbor some answers for my shattered peace of mind. I don't know whether knowing who or what killed Frank will bring me any peace, but considering the circumstances of that grisly scene, I remain hopelessly disturbed, grasping at unrequitable closure. Last night, while smoking on the fire escape, a figure, impossible to mistake, locked eyes with me from the ground below. The next day, as I walked the streets of Crescent City, I couldn't ignore the overwhelming uneasiness that weighed on me. My steps felt heavier, and my mind kept playing back the gore-soaked memory from two nights ago. That fateful scene remained as vivid as ever, refusing any peace or solace. I couldn't shake the feeling that those monstrous, yellow eyes were surveying me from afar. The streets during the daytime provided some semblance of safety. The wind whispered as it brushed past my face, echoed by the comforting hum of a bustling town. Even so, it wasn't enough to strip away my paranoia. It was late in the evening when I received a notification on my phone. As I opened it, my heart skipped a beat. It was an email from Red Owl the YouTube channel I had contacted hoping to find answers about the creature that had mercilessly killed Frank. You need to come with me, read a text from Keith, one of my close friends. He mentioned having found something during his late night runs near the woods, a desolated location not too far away from where Frank had met his tragic end. Ignoring my hesitations and keeping my inhibitions aside, I headed out with Keith. As we trudged through the foliage, my chest heaved with anxiety. Every rustle in the bushes or snap in the underbrush sent a shiver through me. After what felt like hours, Keith halted at a clearing hidden behind overgrown branches and foliage. Before us stood a crudely constructed altar covered in dried bloodstains and entrails its purpose clear to anyone who stumbled across this sickening sight. Surrounding it was evidence of past sacrifices, bones gnawed clean of flesh and agonized expressions locked on to decayed faces. That thing, it's been here, I breathed out in horror. Stay quiet! Keep your voice low! Keith whispered sharply, grabbing my arm with force. Fear squeezed his voice as tightly as he squeezed my arm. It was true. There was no denying it. 
The sinister creature I had encountered had held its reign of terror in this very spot, its merciless axe echoing through the air. Suddenly, Key's phone buzzed, and we momentarily froze in our tracks. The horror that washed over Keith's face was unmistakable. Frantically showing me his screen, I saw it was a live video feed sent to both our phones via an untraceable email. A gut-wrenching shriek forced its way into our eardrums from the feed, something all too familiar. A dismembered body flashed across the screen before disappearing behind a blurry figure emerging forward its yellow eyes piercing through the darkness of the screen. My heart plummeted into an abyss as deep as the dread that filled my soul. We have to go now. I urged Keith while pulling at his arm with all my might. The air around us seemed to have grown colder. I felt the sinister power growing nearby. It was gearing up to strike at any moment. As we stumbled back through the woods, our breaths labored and sharp with fear, our hearts pounding like drums in our chests. We knew every second passing brought us closer to something unimaginably profane. We barely made it back to town and then stumbled home, fear clawing at us with every step. We barricaded ourselves, racked with terror and dread, within my apartment's walls waiting and praying that some semblance of safety would bless us on these haunted grounds. Days have passed since then, yet there has been no hope for relief or salvation. The nightmare that had come to life continued taking more victims, each one found mutilated beyond recognition. Even now, as the wind whispers again outside my window on another sleepless night, while I chain smoke another cigarette, my heart still races with the memory of those piercing yellow eyes. The monstrosity that lurks in the darkness remains an ever-present threat, haunting our every waking moment and stealing even the solace of slumber from our grasp. Forget about ever hunting it down. We are nothing but powerless pawns on this twisted chessboard, forced to live as victims, never knowing when terror might descend again upon us. This town's fate, like so many others before it, is sealed by an evil that will never fade, forever in question as long as those baleful yellow eyes skulk in the shadows. I was planning to get out of the house for a bit and unwind. Hey, let's go fishing at Silver Lake this weekend, I suggested to my buddy Eric. He agreed instantly, so we packed up our gear and headed out on Friday afternoon. Little did I know that our relaxing trip would turn into an unforgettable encounter with pure terror. Silver Lake, located in Washington State, definitely had its share of spooky rumors and stories attached to it. But both Eric and I were skeptics who didn't really believe in supernatural stuff. We found a nice spot on the lakeside to set up our tents, unpack our things, and start fishing. The first day came and went without any incidents or creepy encounters. We shared funny stories and cracked some silly jokes while sitting around the campfire with our beers. But as night began to fall on the second day, that's when things took a horrifying turn. We were preparing for another night of relaxed fishing when we suddenly heard something in the bushes nearby. It wasn't your typical rustling noise made by small animals. It was more like heavy panting mixed with grumbling sounds. Both of us froze for a moment, unsure whether we should just pack up and leave or simply ignore it. Our curiosities got the better of us as we decided to check out what was making such unnerving noises. We grabbed our flashlights and slowly approached the bushes, trying to keep as quiet as possible so as not to startle whatever was hiding there. With each step closer, the panting grew louder. Sweat dripped down our foreheads as adrenaline coursed through our veins. 
My hand trembled slightly as I pushed aside a branch with my flashlight aimed at whatever might be lurking behind it. What we saw next was beyond our wildest imagination. Piercing yellow eyes glistening from the darkness stared right back at us. This unusually large beast stood on its hind legs like a human but bore the appearance of a wolf. Its snout twisted into a sinister grin, revealing its razor-sharp teeth. It let out a gut-wrenching howl and charged towards us. There wasn't any time to think. Eric and I bolted in opposite directions, hoping to outrun this monstrous creature that was hellbent on getting us. As I ran for my life, I heard the beast following close behind me, snapping at my heels. At one point, it got so close that it managed to tear through my pants leg with its claws. I don't know how, but I managed to make a sharp turn in between some trees, risking a glance back just in time to see the creature miss me by inches as it crashed into the tree trunk. It snarled and circled around for another attempt at getting me. Meanwhile, Eric managed to climb up onto one of the higher branches of a nearby tree. From up there, he could see the creature hounding me relentlessly. Taking advantage of an opportunity as the creature paused for a second, he picked up a rock from another branch and threw it at the beast, attempting to interfere with its pursuit. Thankfully, the rock hit it square in the head. The monster staggered back for a moment before shifting its attention to my friend, now hiding among the leaves above. As it leaped at the tree trunk, trying to reach him in vain, I knew this was my chance to save both our lives. I reached our campsite with legs that felt like jelly and fumbled around for my keys as fast as possible without dropping them under pressure. With a collective sigh of relief as we drove away from Silver Lake and left that demonic entity behind us, we swore never to speak about what happened that night again. Weeks later, after we came back from our trip, I couldn't help but think about what transpired that night. I contacted a local historian, Mr. Williams, who told me chilling stories about gruesome encounters with that creature, often referred to as the Silver Lake Dogman. Although we tried to suppress the memories of that night at Silver Lake, life somehow found a way to remind us of that horrifying experience. Over the next few days, Eric and I noticed peculiar changes in our daily routines. The air seemed eerily still, and dark clouds loomed overhead. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being followed. We decided to confront our fears and find a way to protect ourselves. On Friday, at 5.37 p.m., Eric and I visited the local library, hoping for answers about how to deal with this supernatural creature. Scouring through dusty, leather-bound books, we zeroed in on one loaded with folk tales that contained precautions against beings like the dogmen. Unbeknownst to us, time flew by as we absorbed each page until we realized it was already 9.32 p.m. In some sources we read, it was suggested that using objects blessed by a holy person could repel such entities. With this information in hand, we contacted an elderly priest living nearby who agreed to come and perform a cleansing at our homes. On Sunday morning, around 10.15 a.m., the old priest appeared at our doorstep with his bags of holy items. Moving from room to room, he worked diligently, performing ceremonies that seemed to brighten each corner. Finally, he blessed several bottles of water, turned them into holy water, and instructed us on how to use them against any malevolent presence, spritzing ourselves whenever we felt threatened. Relieved about successfully cleansing our homes and equipped with this newfound knowledge on protection against evil forces, we returned to our daily lives. The heavy atmosphere dissipated over the next two days, giving us a sense of security. However, one fateful day, 
Our ordeal took a darker turn when one of our mutual friends went missing during a solo hiking trip in the woods near Silver Lake. We took it upon ourselves to search for her, despite knowing the risks involved. On Tuesday, at 3.18 p.m., we cautiously ventured towards Silver Lake. The sky was overcast, which added to the spine-chilling atmosphere already present. As we followed the trail, we noticed deep claw marks on trees and blood stains on fallen leaves. Our hearts raced as we realized that our suspicion could be confirmed soon. Around 5.42 p.m., we stumbled upon a horrifying scene. There lay our friend, with her body gruesomely mutilated. Her head rested a few feet away, an expression of sheer terror etched permanently on her face. What was even more disturbing were the gnarled paw prints surrounding her remains. It was undoubtedly the work of the dogman. We knew this had to end. We decided to confront the dogman at Silver Lake. With holy water in hand just after dusk at 8.07 p.m., we approached the exact spot where our nightmare began days ago. The bushes began rumbling, and out emerged the massive beast, its yellow eyes gleaming through the darkness, accompanied by a twisted grin that exposed its razor-sharp teeth. Filled with rage and fear, we lunged forward and sprayed holy water at the creature. It hissed and recoiled in pain as the blessed liquid touched its fur-covered body. Before it could regain control of itself, we sprayed again, targeting its eyes. The creature let out an agonizing scream that sent chills down our spines and then retreated into the woods, relentlessly avoiding any more of our attacks. Covered with remnants of its sinister energy that lingered in the air, we returned to our car and drove back home, knowing full well that there was no victory behind us, only survival. The exact moment of our realization hit us at 10.33 p.m., when I dropped Eric off at his house. Our experiences never ceased to haunt us. Friends and families shared stories about unknown creatures roaming the woods near Silver Lake. However, knowing that we had somehow managed to evade the dogman's clutches brought us some solace, and a conviction to never venture back to those cursed woods. Our lives proceeded, but the shadows from the past would always follow us, whispering that lurking deep within those woods, the creature still waited, marking its time for the next unsuspecting prey. We swore never to forget what we had endured and promised ourselves not to let our guard down. After all, as Eric once said, some dangers are better left untouched. It was the kind of weekend that made you want to just sleep in and lounge around the house. It happened a couple of years ago, right around the time my brother, Jerry, decided that he wanted to play the role of the local bad boy. At this point in my life, I was only really interested in spending time with my buddies, watching TV shows, or playing video games. It was Saturday afternoon when Jerry returned from his typical day of cavorting with the town misfits and suggested we head out to an abandoned farmhouse just outside our suburban neighborhood in Illinois. There were always whispers about that place being cursed. Around here, it seems every innocent-looking structure has its fair share of gory tales attached to it. But as skeptical teenagers, we didn't pay any heed to those stories. As we approached the dilapidated farmhouse, I figured it was going to be a harmless misadventure, another story for us to tell at school. Little did I know how wrong that assumption would be. The sun started to dip below the horizon, painting the sky orange and pink as we stepped into the creaking building. The group we were with, Jerry's friends, didn't have much on their minds except for thoughts of booze and other illicit substances. 
but as they partied and laughed away inside that grimy old house, I noticed something out by the deserted fields. In the distance stood what appeared to be a large, canine-like figure devouring something it had caught. Curious but horror-stricken, I tried my best to convince Jerry's friends' stoner minds that something bizarre was happening. Eventually, Tom, a guy who's always been kind of an older brother figure in our little gang, agreed to check out what I'd seen earlier. Perhaps he could suppress his fears better than me. But isn't it funny how often bravery is just another form of stupidity? We crept our way out, following the direction I had spotted the creature or animal, whatever it was. As we reached the edge of the field, we noticed a mutilated deer in a pool of blood. It was partially eaten, and while unsettling, the sight alone didn't really freak us out. Then we noticed the footprints circular impressions with massive claws that tore through mud and gravel alike. Assuming it was some massive bear, we thought it best to head back to, holy shit. Suddenly, an ear-shattering howl came from somewhere around us. The sound sent shivers down my spine. It felt like a thousand needles piercing my soul. Before I could even wrap my head around what was happening, I heard a symphony of gut-wrenching snarls closing in on us. As adrenaline kicked in, Tom and I sprinted back to the farmhouse, alerting Jerry that something was wrong. The group sobered up real quick when they saw our ashen faces and wide eyes. In just a matter of minutes, all the gloves were off. I told you! It's a fucking werewolf or something! One guy shouted as we scrambled for anything that could pass as a weapon. The claws of whatever or whoever it was scraped against wood panes and bricks as it circled the farmhouse, daring us inside to abandon our safe haven. Lumbering howls contrasted with hushed cries as we weighed our limited options. Seconds felt like hours with every shallow breath or gnaw of fear-filled teeth upon your tongue. As soon as we realized the gravity of the situation, we decided we needed a plan to escape this living nightmare. I could barely think straight, while the horrifying sounds of the creature's snarls grew closer. Sarah, one of Jerry's friends who happened to be with us that night, came up with an idea. Let's set a trap, she whispered. We can use the deer's remains as bait and create a diversion. None of us had a better suggestion, so we agreed reluctantly. We placed the deer remains on one side of the farmhouse and assigned Johnny, another friend, to light an old kerosene lantern nearby. The flickering light cast eerie shadows on the walls, only adding to our shared panic. Then each one of us took whatever makeshift weapon we could find, wooden planks with rusted nails, broken glass bottles, even an old crowbar, ready to defend ourselves in case all hell broke loose. The time was around 9.47 p.m., and I remember wishing that we could turn back time and erase our stupidity forever coming to this cursed place. The howling and snarling grew louder as the monster approached. What I saw next made my skin crawl. It had unnaturally large muscles towering over us at probably over seven feet tall and dripping with gore from its latest meal. Its eyes gleamed with a sinister bloodlust. It was more intelligent than any regular creature had any right to be. Run! I shouted as Johnny threw the burning lantern at the beast. Flames enveloped it for a brief moment, eliciting a tormented roar from within. We scattered in different directions and met at an agreed-upon rendezvous spot about half a mile away from the farmhouse. Once we regrouped and made sure everyone was accounted for, we decided to call 911, but not before coming up with a story that wouldn't make us sound completely insane. We agreed that we would tell the police that a beastly maniac, a serial killer, would explain the monstrous scratches on the house and the deer's mangled state. 
The authorities reached the location at 10.24 p.m., guns drawn, and were searching for the so-called deranged murderer. They found nothing but blood and wreckage, with no trace of our terrifying foe. Afterward, they dismissed it as a prank or perhaps the work of an oddly vicious animal. Questions came our way, but eventually, we were sent home. Safe. We never mentioned that night to anyone else. We each buried our memories deep within ourselves, too afraid to relive those moments. Two days after that encounter, I discovered a peculiar scraping noise outside my window in the middle of the night. Breathing heavily, scared to move even an inch, I peeked at the shadows dancing on the wall as if they were eating away at reality itself. While it could be my mind playing tricks because of what transpired recently, something tells me it isn't over. Those cruel growls that drift outside on moonlit nights remind me to never forget or underestimate what terror hides in dark corners. We may have survived once by sheer luck and determination, but there's always a gnawing fear at the back of each one of us who faced that gruesome creature in that dilapidated farmhouse nightmare. And as days go by and strange scratching continues here and there around town, or perhaps only in our imaginations, I worry if our past monsters will ever truly be laid to rest. The air was thick with anticipation that day. You know when something's brewing, but you can't really put your finger on it. It was one of those days, the fringes of change. My eyes scanned the landscape as my mind wandered. Little did I know just how intense this change would be. I'd been staying with my cousin Matt and his wife, Jessica, at their semi-secluded cabin in Placer County. California. They lived a few miles from civilization, so we had time to catch up without distractions. The events I'm about to recall happened during a particularly calm evening when we were sitting around the fire pit in the backyard. It seemed like a regular night, gazing at the stars with warm conversations and bundled up laughter. But then we heard it, an unfamiliar sound that caused our heads to pivot into the dense tree line beyond the fiery halo of light. The guttural rasp sent shivers through our bones as we scanned the darkness for its origin. Slowly, a figure emerged from behind a nearby tree, its eyes shimmering beneath the firelight like liquid silver orbs. We froze at the sight of it, a tall, hairy creature with muscular limbs and an elongated snout resembling a wolf or large dog. Matt, always the cool head in our family, managed to whisper over his trembling breath. What the fuck is that? The tension was almost palpable as its eyes bore through our collective souls. The realization dawned on me. Werewolf or dogman, either one spelled disaster. Just as abruptly as it appeared, the beast retreated back into darkness with heavy footsteps that crunched leaves as it disappeared from sight. We exchanged terrified glances and decided not to stick around for its return. We dashed inside, slamming and locking every door and window in sight. Jessica called the local authorities and they promised to send officers after offering skepticism-laced condolences. Their indecision proved costly. As we debated our options and consoled one another, the electricity suddenly died, plunging us into pitch-black darkness. A gut-churning feeling sank in as we prepared for the worst. By now, fear had consumed us. We heard noises on the roof followed by heavy thuds and growling outside the walls. It was then that we decided to act. Quick! Grab anything you can use as a weapon! Matt ordered. We fumbled around in the dark, desperately searching for items to improve our chances of survival. 
the walls began to crack from its sheer force. Thick tufts of first sticking through gouge would indicated entry would not be far off. I found myself clutching a fire poker as Matt wielded a loaded hunting rifle he'd managed to find in complete darkness. Jessica was prepared with a sturdy baseball bat. We readied ourselves for the inevitable assault on our improvised fortress. But then something odd happened. The vicious sounds stopped just as abruptly as they began. Our hearts paused in their rapid beating as we questioned reality itself. Was it gone? Matt bravely decided to peek out, his hunting rifle at the ready. He scanned our surroundings and whispered, It's gone. Despite his words, disbelief still gnawed at our minds like an incessant itch that couldn't be scratched away. This wasn't any ordinary creature we were dealing with. It was intelligent and terrifyingly patient. The next few days integrated normalcy before this gruesome cycle would start again, tossing from relative peace into a tense game of predator and prey. Days later, we heard rumors from a neighbor down the road, a man named Charlie who claimed to have seen something similar lurking near his cellar door at night, an elusive being that evoked pure dread within him. The following morning, the sun peeked through the curtains as we hesitantly welcomed the day. Breakfast was unnervingly quiet, with the events of the previous night clearly weighing heavily on our minds. We discussed our options in hushed voices, uncertain of whether that sinister creature could hear us or not. After a considerable amount of deliberation, we decided that we couldn't stay here any longer. It was only a matter of time before this malevolent beast breached our sanctuary. We'd call Charlie and see if he'd experienced any similar occurrences since his initial sighting and ask for any advice on what to do. As I dialed Charlie's number and waited for him to answer, I noticed scratches on the windowsill, deep gashes clearly indicating attempts to break in. The hair on the back of my neck stood up as fear enveloped me like an icy cloak. Charlie picked up on my desperation instantly. It seemed he too had been experiencing escalated attacks on his property. His voice trembled as he recounted how his security cameras had caught that monstrous being circling his home every night since his first encounter, its insatiable hunger evident in its vicious snarl. But then he mentioned an old legend, a local Native American folktale about a creature called an Elisophilea, or shadow being, that was raised from the depths of darkness by an ancient shaman with nefarious intentions. To appease it, the tribe brought offerings, driving the creature back into obscurity when fed. We were skeptical, but seeing no other alternative, we agreed to try this ancient ritual to deter the malevolent beast. Charlie provided us with some crucial, sacred items, herbs and pouches filled with protective tokens that he had gathered over time. That evening, we positioned ourselves just outside the edge of our property, where sightings were most frequent. Clutching our makeshift offerings tightly, we began reciting the chants Charlie taught us ancient words from a long-forgotten time. As we continued, a deep sense of foreboding filled the air around us. Suddenly, the wind picked up, sending a flurry of leaves swirling around us as the temperature dropped dramatically. We strained to hear over the cacophony of nature's revolt. A blood-curdling howl sliced through the air, and there, just beyond our makeshift circle, stood that behemoth monstrosity with its piercing silver eyes and enormous, razor-sharp claws. Our hearts raced as we continued our chants, hands trembling as we held our offerings out toward the creature. Time seemed to distort as its snarl dissipated into an eerie silence. The creature eyed our offerings hesitantly before snatching them up in its massive jaws. To our astonishment and relief, 
It turned and retreated into the darkness without another sound or movement. We stood in shock for a few moments longer before regaining our wits and rushing back inside the cabin. Over the next few days, we maintained tense vigilance, but there was no sign of that sinister beast's return. It seemed the mysterious charm had worked, at least for now. But we couldn't shake that unnerving feeling that it still lurked nearby, biding its time until hunger called it forth once more an eerie reminder that some dangers are always present on the fringes of our lives. Before leaving Placer County for good, Matt warned the neighbors about what had transpired and passed along Charlie's advice on appeasing creatures forced into our world through ancient rituals best forgotten. To this day, when visiting family in California, I avoid looking too deeply into shadows cast by moonlight or venturing too close to wooded areas after dark. Some things are better off in their dark seclusion. May they never venture close to our reality again. My shift had just ended at the local gas station on the outskirts of a small town in California, and as was my routine, I stopped at our local diner for a late night bite to eat. The place was buzzing with activity. My friend Megan was working behind the counter, and her sarcastic wit always made the night go by faster. Hey, a stranger, she said, greeting me with a smirk. Your usual? You know it. I chuckled as I slid onto a stool. And add one of your crazy stories you swear are true. Megan rolled her eyes playfully but obliged. As she refilled my coffee cup, she told me about some strange happenings out by Devil's Creek, an area that had always been plagued by bizarre incidents. Footprints had been found around houses, terrifying howls echoing through the night. But I wasn't one to buy into that stuff, so I mostly just humored her. Days after our conversation, I found myself driving down a lonely stretch of road not too far from Devil's Creek. It was dark, save for the headlights of my pickup truck cutting through the night. A dense fog had settled over the entire area, making it difficult to see more than a few feet in front of me. Suddenly, I spotted something darting across the road in front of me. It looked like a large animal from what little I could make out through the fog. Instinctively, I slammed on the brakes to avoid hitting it. However, my tires screeched as they skidded across the wet pavement. When my truck finally came to a stop, inches from whatever that thing was, I got a better look at it. I couldn't believe my eyes. This animal looked like some sort of wolf-dog hybrid, but it was bigger than anything I'd ever seen. Its muscles rippled under matted fur as it turned its massive head toward me and snarled. Its teeth were unnaturally large, and its eyes were an eerie yellow color that seemed almost unnatural when it pierced through the fog. My pulse raced as I slowly tried backing my truck away from the nightmarish creature. But to my horror, it seemed intent on following me. I attempted to put some distance between us but ended up running into another car parked by the side of the road, as if we'd arrived at some unexpected gathering of vehicles. What the hell is going on here? I muttered to myself, gripping the steering wheel so tight that my knuckles turned white. Several other people stranded motorists whose cars were also parked haphazardly along this lonely stretch of road, had cautiously emerged from their vehicles, their expressions a mix of confusion and fear. A collective gasp made my head snap toward Megan, who stood a few cars away with her phone out, trying to take photos. What are you doing? I hissed in panic. But before she could answer, the monstrous animal began attacking a couple just meters away. It was fast, vicious, and merciless, leaving them lying broken and lifeless on the ground before turning its attention elsewhere. 
My mind raced as I weighed my options. My surroundings seemed too open and exposed, but staying put in my damaged truck didn't seem like a viable option either, especially since more of these creatures prowled about in the dense fog. Everybody get inside your cars. It's not safe out here, someone screamed from behind me. Before anyone could react, another one of those monstrous wolves sprung out of nowhere and went for them. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and part of me wondered if this was some ongoing hallucination combined with Megan's gruesome stories. But as more screams filled the air with terror, reality struck hard. This was happening right now, and we were all in danger. Scrambling back into my truck, I found myself locked in a personal hell as blood-curdling howls serenaded those trying desperately not to become their next victims. The other drivers and I occasionally made eye contact, each conveying a single message. If we wanted to stand any chance of surviving this gruesome encounter, we had to find a way to escape these horrifying creatures from the depths of Devil's Creek. Huddled together in the cramped confines of my damaged truck, Megan and I cowered in my truck, watching the gruesome scene unfold. The creatures circled around us, picking off the unfortunate ones who had gotten out of their cars. Their screams were muffled and drowned out by the thick fog that enveloped everything in its embrace. In the distance, I noticed a faint glow slowly approaching our location. Desperate for any chance at survival, I hoped it was a sign of salvation, perhaps headlights from an approaching vehicle or law enforcement. As the light came closer, it became apparent that it wasn't an ordinary vehicle. Through the fog, we began to see a line of people dressed in dark robes, carrying lanterns. They moved in eerie unison along the road, appearing unaffected by the horrors surrounding them. Suddenly, a gut-wrenching screech sounded through the air as one of the creatures charged towards the robed figures. To our shock, instead of running away or becoming victims themselves, they raised their arms in tandem and chanted words we couldn't comprehend. In that moment, something unfathomable happened. The creature stopped dead in its tracks, frozen mid-leap with its fearsome teeth exposed. The robed people continued their chant as several more creatures approached and suffered the same fate, frozen and powerless. Afraid but curious, we slowly exited my truck and approached them cautiously. Who are you? I demanded to know. The leader of the group pulled down his hood and looked at us with sorrowful eyes. We are seekers, he explained solemnly. For generations, our order has been tasked with containing these abominations, offspring of a cursed creature older than recorded history. His voice shook as he continued. They shouldn't have escaped our containment area near Devil's Creek. We apologize for your losses tonight. But it's now time for us to return them to their prison. The lead seeker waved his hand towards the frozen creatures and they began floating off the ground as if lifted by invisible strings. The entire group, along with the monstrous beings, started to depart into the fog. As we watched them go, I could scarcely believe what had transpired. What started as a night filled with horror and bloodshed was now drawing to an eerie close as the Seekers took control of what we now knew were ancient, cursed creatures. Megan clutched my arm tightly as we stood in the eerily still night, surrounded by wreckage and destruction. We were two survivors among countless others left to deal with the physical and emotional scars from that night. Together with the few remaining drivers who managed to stay alive, we regrouped and formulated a plan to get help for our lost friends, but deep down, we knew that no amount of assistance would ever erase the memories that haunted us from that hellish encounter. 
We suddenly realized what Megan spoke about during our shared meal in the diner held more weight than we had imagined. There was a force beyond understanding lurking just beyond our sleepy town's borders. And although these cursed beings were gone for now, something told us this wasn't going to be the last encounter we'd have with them. We pushed on, doing our best to heal and support one another. But every time heavy fog rolled into town, we couldn't help but feel a chill deep in our bones, waiting for the nightmares from Devil's Creek to return. My father always used to tell me, the only thing worse than being unprepared is being too afraid to act when the time comes. Honestly, I never thought much about it because nothing exciting ever happened in our sleepy town of Brooksville, Kentucky. But now that I'm recalling this strange chain of events, that old saying is eerily fitting. It all began in July 2003. There was something in the air that summer, and not just humidity. Everyone seemed on edge for no apparent reason. The sense of unease grew stronger when several townsfolk started reporting incidents of torn-up livestock near the woods. People would find bloody remains, hooves, fur, and bone fragments, splayed out on their properties. One morning on my way to work, I came across a graphic scene in the middle of the road. It looked like a deer had been ripped to shreds. Guts and muscle were strewn about, turning my stomach sour with the nausea-inducing sight. Not knowing what else to do, I called the police. What's going on? Some sicko has been tearing up animals, said Officer Jim Donahue when he arrived at the scene. Once we got through exchanging pleasantries and catching up, an unnerved Jim revealed this was happening all over town. Things took a hairier turn when locals started spotting an imposing bipedal creature in the woods at night. Descriptions varied a bit but commonly included matted brownish fur and reddish-orange eyes that glinted malevolently through the trees. Eyewitnesses reported it as having razor-sharp teeth and claws like a bear's but more sinister looking. The stories circulated all over town until eventually reaching my workplace, Brooksville Feed and Hardware Store, where I was chatting with Sam Walker during my lunch break. Y'all think there's some truth to all this? Sam asked me cautiously. I don't know, man. Even if there is something lurking around, what could we do about it? I responded almost cynically. The next day, as my shift ended, I clocked out and noticed my car wouldn't start. Since the mechanic was closed for the day, I decided to walk home. It was dark, and I chose to take a shortcut through the woods that separated Brooksville feed and hardware from my home. As I made my way through the dense foliage, an eerie silence enveloped me. Suddenly, a spine-tingling growl broke the silence. It was like nothing I've ever heard before, giving me ice-cold goosebumps all over. I turned around instinctively but saw nothing in the darkness. Hello? Who's there? I stuttered. A malicious growl echoed again through the trees, closer now. Feeling panic rising in my chest, I started walking faster. The growling continued. It was getting astoundingly close. A rustle of leaves behind me signaled an approaching presence. Out of sheer fright and maybe stupidity too, I tripped and dropped my flashlight. My eyes widened as they ultimately adjusted to the night and beheld an enormous creature from all the stories. Matted fur covered its humanoid frame. Teeth and claws gleamed in the scarce moonlight. There I was, on the ground, staring at the creature that seemed to have appeared straight out of a horror movie. Its eyes bore into mine, making me feel like it could see my deepest thoughts and fears. 
My heart pounded in my chest, and my breaths came in shallow, rapid gasps. Time seemed to slow down as the monster approached me, raising one of its long, dangerous clawed arms. Suddenly, there was a loud sound that shook the trees, a gunshot. The creature's head snapped to the side, momentarily breaking its ominous gaze. I turned to see my neighbor Tom standing just beyond the trees, a shotgun clutched in his trembling hands. Run! he shouted at me. I didn't need to be told twice. I scrambled to my feet and took off towards my house with adrenaline coursing through my veins. I could still hear growls behind me, but they were becoming more distant as the seconds passed. I finally made it back to my house and burst through the front door, panting heavily with fright. My wife greeted me with a concerned look on her face but didn't ask questions when she saw my terrified expression. We immediately locked all the doors and windows before racing upstairs to check on our daughter. Tom arrived at our house only minutes later with an extended arm holding his shotgun cautiously in front of him. As we sat in our living room, trying to catch our breaths and process what had just happened, he explained that he'd been tracking the creature for days since it snatched his dog from his backyard one night. He knew there was something unnatural about it, something sinister. Over the next couple of days, word spread throughout town about the monster that inhabited our woods. But none dared enter the forest for fear of encountering the beast lurking within those shadowy depths again. As stories unfolded of more gruesome findings or mutilated animals discovered early in the morning, the fear factor quickly escalated. Streets were emptied by nightfall each day, and though people huddled together in their homes for safety, no one could truly relax. On the fourth day after my encounter, we discovered that the creature had struck again. This time, it was old Pete from down the road. His body was found a few hours after he went out to investigate an ungodly screech from his chicken's coop. His remains were barely recognizable, covered in deep gashes, and partially devoured. The townsfolk, desperate to put an end to this nightmare, decided to attempt the unthinkable. They would drive the creature out of the woods or destroy it if they could. Gathered under a cloud of trepidation, they entered the woods, armed with their shotguns and trembling hands, ready to confront the abomination that had come to terrorize our town. Search parties roamed through the trees for many hours before one group finally stumbled upon something truly horrifying. A makeshift den within a hidden alcove littered with bones and ripped clothes. A confrontation with the beast soon arose as it appeared unexpectedly, glowering back at them from amidst a dense tangle of vines and branches. Shouts rang out, and screams danced on the wind of that twilight hour until an unnerving silence settled over the grotesque scene. But when I visited Town Hall afterward to get updates on what happened in those woods, no sign of a corpse belonging to that fiendish creature was to be found. The only evidence of its existence was the suddenly haunting memories it left behind in our town's scarred souls. As weeks turned into months and then into years, Brooksville slowly attempted to rebuild its sense of safety and security. People still locked their doors tightly at night and stared warily into dark shadows that seemed to promise lurking dangers just beyond their reach. And although no sightings have surfaced since that fateful night five long years ago, when the beast seemingly vanished into thin air, an eerie eeriness still hovers over our town like a spectral fog. We cannot forget the horrors of the past, nor can we entirely deny their improbability to resurface in the shadows of an unguarded moment. Brooksville will forever remain a place scarred by fear and the specters of its dark memory. For here, in the depths of our hearts, we know a monstrous presence still lurks, hidden, waiting, 
and perhaps even observing us from afar with bloodthirsty eyes. There I was, yet another Tuesday night at the local dive bar, elbow deep in a bowl of chili cheese fries and nursing a cold beer. I don't remember if it was in 2014 or 2015, but it was a sweltering summer evening in the small town of Schulzburg, Wisconsin. The sun had disappeared behind the rolling hills, and the sky was a steely gray. I was sharing some jokes with John, my best friend since high school. John and I had this ritual where we'd play pool, down beers, and burst into laughter at our corny jokes. It was our way of coping with life's hardships. We both recently lost our jobs at the local factory due to downsizing, John even more so than me since he was the sole breadwinner of his family. Every once in a while during our games, someone would mention sightings of strange creatures lurking around town lately. The regulars often had crazy stories about creepy encounters in Schulzburg, but I never thought much of them. We just sunk the last ball and were walking out into the warm night when we heard a blood-curdling scream. My blood ran cold as my eyes scrambled to locate the source of that bone-chilling sound. We bolted towards the noise, finding ourselves sprinting down a poorly lit alley towards an old abandoned building, where we found Cindy Turner, a girl from our high school days, lying on the ground with her arms savagely torn off. As Cindy writhed in agony on the cold asphalt, we scanned our surroundings for any glimpse of her attacker. That's when we saw it, standing atop an old rusted dumpster not too far away its eyes burning into ours as it snarled menacingly at us. I'd seen many weird things around Schulzburg growing up, but nothing prepared me for this sight. An unnaturally large, hulking figure, shaggy and covered in matted fur, with powerful limbs that ended in sharp claws. Its snout was elongated like a wolf's, revealing a row of blood-stained fangs. We couldn't hide our fear any longer. We were facing something not remotely human. John gave me a determined look and whispered, We have to get the hell out of here and call the cops. Cindy doesn't have much time. As we tried to carry Cindy away from her tormentor, our backs turned momentarily toward the creature. Big mistake. In one swift movement, it hurled itself into the air and landed within inches of us. It snarled and snapped at our faces, saliva dripping from its fearsome jaws. We stumbled backward, stumbling over ourselves in a desperate attempt to put distance between us and the beast. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught sight of an old, rusty pipe lying on the ground beside us. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I grabbed it and swung for all I was worth. Miraculously, it connected with a sickening crash that sent the creature reeling, buying us precious seconds to get away. We took off like bats out of hell, half dragging Cindy back down the alleyway towards town. The creature was hot on our heels, snarling and growling, vying for our lives. It felt like an eternity before we finally reached the safety of John's car, parked outside one of the bars on Main Street. Just as we slammed the door shut behind us with an agonized scream of relief, panic coursing through every fiber of our being, there was a deafening thud as something slammed into the front windshield. We yelled and slammed on the gas pedal while frantically calling 911, tears streaming down our faces as we fought to stay alive. Days after the encounter, the whole town was buzzing about the incident. Some claimed that the beast went by the name Barrick, was a werewolf, and had been tormenting the nearby woods for decades, even though no one could seem to agree on a single origin story. After escaping the clutches of the beast, 
We rushed Cindy to the nearest hospital, desperately hoping that someone could help her. We spent hours frantically pacing the waiting room as the surgeons did everything in their power to stabilize her condition. Meanwhile, we recounted our harrowing experience to the police, trying our best to describe the horror that was etched into our minds. As we sat in that hospital, praying for Cindy's survival, news of other town residents falling victim to the creature began flooding in. Word quickly spread about a series of chilling attacks, leading people throughout Schulzburg to panic. It was clear we couldn't control this vicious monster on our own. We needed help. Three days after our encounter with the beast, the townspeople banded together and enlisted a group of hunters experienced in tracking down creatures of lore. These brave souls weren't your typical game hunters and seemed unfazed by what they were going against. Gathered at the town hall, they provided us with a detailed plan for trapping Barrack. The hunters would set bait across various strategic points, using fresh animal meat marinated with a powerful tranquilizer strong enough to subdue such an enormous creature. We were all silently skeptical about their plans as they loaded their rifles and prepared to face our nightmare head-on. The first night passed uneventfully. There were no signs of Barrack or any evidence of it taking the bait. However, on the second night, the tension became palpable when one of our lookout points reported seeing those haunting, fiery eyes through their binoculars. The chase was on. Racing through forests and over hillsides, dodging trees and wading through thick underbrush, we followed closely behind our hunting team as they pursued Barrack by moonlight. Eventually, we stumbled upon remnants of a grisly scene, limbs thrown around haphazardly amidst thick pools of blood painted across shrubs and trees. The team had found Barrack's lair. With a mounting sense of horror, we could see the beast hadn't spared even the local wildlife, and the pungent stench of decay assaulted our senses. Suddenly, we heard a deep, gut-wrenching roar not far from us. One of our hunters excitedly announced that Barrack had finally taken the bait. With eagerness and trepidation both combined, we cautiously approached the creature that had tormented us all. Barrack lay on its side, its massive body in a peaceful slumber thanks to the tranquilizer. The drug was designed to put it into a deep sleep so that it could be contained long enough for us to transport it out of town, far, far away from Schulzburg. The plan had worked. Momentarily, Calm returned to our lives as we cautiously let down our guard, knowing that this murderous beast was en route to an undisclosed location. Late on the night of Barrack's capture, I received a call from John. His tone spooked me. His voice trembled as he struggled to form coherent words. They're all dead, he whispered. My blood ran cold as he informed me that something had eradicated every member of the hunting team responsible for subduing Barrack. The creature couldn't be responsible. It was secure and far away from town by now. But still, carefully trying not to think about what might have happened to those men, I slipped out into the night to pay my respects and perhaps find answers. As I stood in silence over their remains, talking softly with some of their family members, something in the distance caught my eye. Reflected moonlight briefly revealed a tall figure moving among the trees a figure with hauntingly familiar fiery eyes. The terror coursed through me once again. Though Barrack was gone, our nightmare had not yet ended. Whatever it was stayed hidden in the shadows, just out of reach. And though nobody dared to speak aloud about the thought that hung over us like a dark cloud, we all knew that these creatures didn't just roam alone. They hunted in packs. A chilling sense of dread crept back over Schulzburg, and nothing would ever be quite the same.
I want to preface this by saying that I have never been one to believe in legends or stories about mythical creatures. To me, it's all just people's ways of entertaining themselves or explaining things they can't understand. The idea that a supernatural being could be lurking out there seems ridiculous. But I can't deny what happened to me and my friends. So here's my second attempt at sharing my story with Red Owl. It was about 10 years ago, in August 2011, when me and some of my college buddies decided to spend the weekend camping in the Chattahoochee National Forest in northern Georgia. We thought it would be fun to disconnect from life for a while, even if just for a few days. The first day was uneventful. We set up our tents, hiked around the area, and enjoyed some grilled burgers in the evening. Around the campfire, we told jokes and swapped stories. The night sky was filled with countless stars, something you don't appreciate enough when living in the city. On the second day, we ventured deeper into the forest, wanting to find a hiking trail someone mentioned at a nearby gas station when we were stocking up on supplies before arriving at the campsite. As we walked through the dense trees, I noticed James suddenly tensing up. He nodded towards some claw-like impressions on a tree trunk. What do you think made those? He asked nervously. My buddy Neil snorted derisively and replied, Probably a bear getting his itch on. We all laughed it off, but I couldn't help but notice how unusually deep and precise those marks were. We never found the hiking trail, so we decided to head back to camp before it got dark. Along the way, we stumbled across something that stopped us in our tracks. It appeared to be an abandoned campsite. The remains of a fire pit lay cold and undisturbed. What was really unnerving, though, were the slashed-up tents and ripped-open backpacks scattered around. There wasn't a trace of the people who had been camping there. Caution outweighed our curiosity by that point. We turned back to our own camp with a sense of unease settling among us. We tried to convince ourselves that those tattered tents were probably from some previous visitors who left in a hurry. When we got back to our campsite, we debated whether or not to stay for the night. Our collective nerves made that decision difficult. It didn't help when Neil swore he heard distant howling sounds, something none of us could confirm given that it was barely perceivable over our heated arguments over staying or packing up immediately. We eventually decided to rough it out and spend one more night. That decision proved to be fateful. Instead of gathering around the fire like the night before, we retreated into our tents after an early dinner, each seemingly preferring the company of their own thoughts and trying to get some rest. Sometime during the night, I was roused from my sleep by a gut-wrenching scream, followed by panicked shouting from one of my friends named Jack. I scrambled out of my tent only to find Jackie's tent shredded, with blood splattered all over the torn fabric. He had been dragged away into the darkness. The next few moments were a whirlwind, desperate screams for help. Neil frantically wielding his belt knife as if doing so would fend off an attacker, and everyone trying to stay together despite our terror driving us towards a primal urge to flee in separate directions. That's when it appeared, tall, bipedal, and covered in coarse matted fur. It had long canine teeth protruding from both jaws, giving me a perfect image of Jack's assailant even in the dim moonlight instinct kicked in, and many started to sprint away from this horrific creature. I followed after Neil blindly, doing everything in my power to suppress the nausea from the images and emotions flooding my mind. We didn't see James and a few of the others again after that night. My heart pounded in my ears, and all I wanted to do was run, but I knew that it wouldn't do any good. The creature was faster than any of us could ever hope to be. 
Neil and I kept sprinting through the forest. There was no time for thinking. Each step was fueled by pure terror. As we ran, the howling sounds grew even more piercing and sinister. It seemed like the creature was mocking us, toying with us like a predator stalking its prey. Suddenly, Neil slumped down onto a massive log that lay beside the wooded pathway. His face contorted in pain, and his arm gashed open where the creature had managed to graze him during our escape. Blood poured down his arm, staining the fallen leaves beneath. We need to find a way out of here, Neil whispered hoarsely between deep breaths. I didn't know what to say, given our circumstances. Let's just keep moving till we find help, I murmured, knowing full well that our chances were slim. Somehow, we mustered up enough strength to get back on our feet and continue on. As we stumbled through the woods, we heard faint rumblings in the distance. Without a second thought, we picked up the pace and tried as best as we could to follow the sound despite our exhaustion. What lay ahead both relieved and terrified us simultaneously, a construction site. It wasn't much, merely an abandoned building project half completed, yet it was something other than trees surrounding us with endless darkness. We crossed into the clearing, where we found a truck left over at the site. With trembling fingers, Neil fiddled with the wires until he finally managed to start it up. The truck sputtered and groaned under our weight as we drove as fast as possible out of that cursed forest. Finally seeing signs of civilization after what felt like an eternity was nothing short of a miracle. We made our way to the nearest hospital, where Neil's wounds were treated and the police were alerted about the horror we'd left behind. As stories of that night spread, many doubted our claims of encountering a supernatural creature. The tale quickly turned into a mere urban legend. However, there were some who quietly admitted to having similar experiences or witnessing the creature near the edge of Chattahoochee National Forest. Of course, their whispered confessions were met with skepticism, too. We never spoke on behalf of those stories as we tried to leave our past behind. We came to know the creature by a name that first only existed in whispers, the Snogtooth Beast. Sometimes I wonder whether it's still lurking among the trees, preying on those who venture too deep into its territory. What happened to James and Jack? I'll never be able to come to terms with it. My thoughts always return to that night when I closed my eyes. Neil and I tried our best to forget, but we'll always bear the scars, physical and emotional, reminding us of our harrowing ordeal with the snarl-tooth beast. Living life after this inescapable nightmare has not been easy for any of us survivors. Every noise at night makes us question whether it followed us back from that ghastly place. No amount of locks or security measures can keep us safe from that gnawing feeling. Thus, we're haunted, not only by what happened in those woods but by an unyielding terror that one day, somehow or another, the snarl-toothed beast may return to finish what it started. It was March 17th, a Sunday, at around 4 p.m. The sun was sinking behind the mountains, casting a hazy golden light over a little town in Vermont. I was in a pub, celebrating St. Patrick's Day the right way, with friends and beer. The atmosphere was lively, people laughing, toasts being made, and banter flying back and forth like ping-pong balls. In the midst of all the merriment, how could I have known that our celebration would take such a turn for the worse? I'm Greg Callahan, by the way, a software engineer born and raised in Vermont, obsessed with coffee and hiking. For all my life, 
I've considered myself pretty down to earth while also enjoying my fair share of sarcasm. My friends would describe me as quick witted and occasionally blunt to the point of giving offense. Just the kind of guy you want on your side of the bar table when people start arguing about politics. As we sat around drinking and exchanging unusual stories from work, our friend Brian brought up sightings of mysterious creatures supposedly living in the nearby woods that most locals dismissed as mere myths or pranks by teenagers. While we didn't yet realize it, his seemingly innocuous tale set us on an eerie trajectory towards meeting something fearsome that even nightmares couldn't depict. At first, we all laughed at Brian's story. But then conversation turned to other strange reports around town. Animals found mutilated in bizarre patterns, mass nests of birds violently abandoned overnight and slowly an uneasy feeling crept through us like a thousand cold fingers tracing down our spines. Some locals claimed that they had encountered this mystifying beast while walking their dogs at night or driving home from work, but no one could give any concrete descriptions of what they witnessed. But we're skeptics by nature, so we decided to trek into those woods ourselves to debunk these ridiculous rumors. Five of us set out into the fading light, armed with nothing but our wits and wicked humor. Me, Brian, Sarah, our token biologist, Liam, and Jessica, two more programmers. We hiked to a well-known forest clearing marked by a large rock surrounded by twisted branches that seemed to claw at it like twisted hands. We had been joking about the so-called creature when suddenly, in the distant thicket of trees, we heard a disturbing, unnatural howl. Our laughter came to an abrupt halt as we cautiously approached the tree line. And then we saw it. To this day, I cannot give a clear description of what was before our terrified eyes. It was massive yet hunched over, a horrifying mix between man and beast with snarling jowls framed by a lupin silhouette. Its matted fur was caked with mud and blood, and it stared at us with an intense hunger in its chilling yellow eyes. This dogman, as I can only describe it, occupied the twilight zone between reality and nightmare. The creature let out another gut-wrenching howl that echoed through the woods like a death knell. None of us moved as fear held us in an icy grip. We were paralyzed by the sheer horror of what was before us. That's when it lunged towards us, with lightning speed and terrifying ferocity. Jessica screamed as she fell backward, narrowly avoiding the lethal swipe. Brian stepped in front of her to protect her from the next attack but wasn't fast enough to dodge its teeth, which sank into his arm, tearing flesh away like tissue paper. As much as I wished to have acted bravely or found an opportunity for escape during this unimaginable encounter, my instincts were frozen under a thick sheet of terror encasing my will to act. Sarah scrambled up the rocks for safety while Liam and I shouted for everyone to run back toward the town. We retreated in a frenzy as the beast continued to scream and snarl at us. None of us dare look back toward the sound of death snapping at our heels. We managed somehow to evade the monstrous creature, our lives intact but our innocence forever lost. It's been months now since that terrifying night in the woods, that hunt for proof only to meet terror in its purest form. We all still carry the emotional scars waking up in a cold sweat after reliving the horror-filled memories night after night. Our lives have changed entirely. I no longer find comfort where once I enjoyed my respite from a concrete world. Local whispers turned into frantic discussion about what we had seen in the woods. Somehow, the overgrown legend seemed more real in the light of day, as if the shadows that had hidden it had ceased to exist. Those cold, yellow eyes seemed permanently etched in my memory. Two days later, 
We learned about a missing farmer who lived nearby where we had been hiking. My heart sank and my stomach twisted at the thought of him encountering that beast. The streets buzzed with rumors and fear as people tried to piece together the man's fate. In our group, Brian was in the hospital recovering from his injuries, while Sarah constantly pushed herself to figure out what kind of creature we encountered. Liam and Jessica mostly tried to forget it ever happened. As for me, that creature haunted every moment of my life. The morning after hearing about the missing farmer, I decided I needed to do something, anything, to try and find out more about this creature. I headed to the public library, hoping I might find an old newspaper or local history book that would offer a clue about what we faced. As I assembled a pile of books on local folklore and supposed cryptids, my curiosity grew stronger over the hours spent flipping through dusty pages. It wasn't until I found an ancient, rotting tome buried beneath other volumes long forgotten that I stumbled upon a story dating back well over a century. The story spoke of a terrifying creature vaguely matching our encounter. The Beast of Black Woods According to legend, every few decades, when the moon was at its darkest, an animalistic horror draped in shadows would emerge from its hidden lair and begin tormenting the small town near the forest. That very night was one such lunar event, a new moon shrouded in shadow. Whatever normalcy had begun creeping back into our lives vanished as the realization struck. This beast was back for blood. We needed to spread the word, alert the authorities, and attempt to secure our safety. The five of us regrouped at Sarah's apartment and shared what we had learned. Horrifyingly, there weren't any methods of deterrence or useful ways to protect ourselves against such a monstrous foe. But knowing about this curse that plagued the area was better than not knowing at all. A meager sense of comfort washed over us as we braced for a night of terror. We were together, and we were ready. As the sun dipped below the horizon, a chorus of eerie growls echoed through the small town. Scattered cries from panicked citizens filled the cold night air as the creature moved through town, leaving destruction and panic in its voracious wake. Broken windows, toppled trash cans, even mangled animals on porches. From our living room vantage point, eyes glued to our surroundings, we watched as the beast would occasionally appear under glowing orange streetlights before dissipating into nothingness. Huddled together on one couch, our faces were drained of color, and beads of sweat glistened on weary faces. It wasn't until hours later that we discovered how it was haunting each street with growing malice and cunning when Liam sobbed out an alarm. It was outside, peering out through the curtains just enough to see without being noticed. My car's speedometer was perfectly aligned with the speed limit, which seemed strange for me as I usually have a heavy foot. I remember thinking, this could all be a commercial about the importance of safe driving. Humming along to a classic rock station, never in a million years would I have imagined the horrors that lay ahead. I'm a pianist and I'd just finished performing at an old theater in a secluded part of West Virginia, making my way home on Route 92. It was getting dark now, and the woods on either side of the road cast eerie shadows dancing against my headlights. To lighten the mood, I imagined how some comedian would call this a prime spot for an alien abduction or something. Somewhere around ten miles from civilization, my car began to sputter and choke, giving up entirely to coast along the pavement before rolling to a stop. I stared at my dashboard in disbelief. There was still half a tank of gas left. As my ears grew used to the new silence surrounding me, 
A stern voice whispered in my head, this wasn't supposed to happen. Emerging from my car with that voice getting ever more insistent, I started checking everything under the hood for anything amiss. Finally deciding it was beyond repair, I decided to walk back toward town. Just before shutting the hood, movement in the corner of my eye caused me to pause. Before me stood two hillbillies that seemed simply out of place. Hey there, one greeted me. His name tag read Tad. It looks like you're having some trouble with your ride. Yeah, I replied cautiously. I was just trying to make it back home, and this piece of junk gave out on me. Well, ain't that a shame? Tad's companion drawled out sarcastically. His name Tag said Earl. Feeling uneasy and slightly annoyed by their presence, I said. Look, I'm fine. I'll just walk back to town and call a tow truck. Thanks for your help, though. Something in the way Tad and Earl exchanged glances made me reconsider walking. Tad scratched the back of his head and hesitated before saying, Listen, there's something you should know about these woods. There's been talk around town about sightings of an unnatural creature roaming around here. Despite my skepticism, I couldn't deny a chill prickling at my skin. And what kind of creature are we talking about? Earl leaned in closer, his face solemn. They call it the Dogman. A beast that looks like a man but has the appearance of a twisted wolf. I laughed out loud, and I felt my nervous tension ease up a little. Right, so we're talking about werewolves now? Anything else I should be aware of? Cyclops? Gnomes? But Tad wasn't laughing with me. He was deadly serious as he whispered. Some folks have gone missing. They just vanished into thin air. Weighing my options silently, I decided to take them up on their offer for a ride back to town. Things started out unremarkable until, rounding a narrow bend, something colossal and monstrous burst from the bushes in front of us. Tad swerved wildly as something huge and furry raced alongside us. Its elongated limbs were just inches from those in the car. We swerved onto an old dirt road that we'd hoped would take us far away from it. With eyes clenched shut in terror, I heard Earl whimpering softly next to me but still managed to catch the two words that would change everything. It's real. The three of us sat in the truck, paralyzed with fear, as the monstrous creature that Tad and Earl had warned me about hurtled alongside us. It moved with unnatural speed. The dogman's twisted grin and sharp, yellow fangs were visible beneath the thick layer of matted fur that covered its body. Damn it, Tad. Go faster. Earl shouted, his voice trembling. I glanced at the clock on the dashboard. It was 10.47 p.m. We had been driving for no more than half an hour since we'd encountered the creature, but it felt like a lifetime. I'm trying, Earl. But this old truck ain't any match for that thing. Tad replied, sweat dripping from his forehead as he floored the acceleration. Suddenly, the truck skidded to a halt as we reached a dead-end road or so it appeared. Ahead of us lay an old abandoned house surrounded by tall grass and trees that seemed to stretch forever into oblivion. We had no other option but to leave the truck and try our luck inside the house. Perhaps we could find somewhere to hide or lock ourselves in until help arrived. As soon as we stepped out of the vehicle, though, we watched in horror as the dogman pounced on a nearby squirrel ripping it apart with its vicious claws in seconds. The guts and blood spattering across the dirt road created a grotesque sight. We raced into the house, leaving behind a gruesome scene of carnage. The door slammed shut just in time before the beast could reach us. The house was pitch black inside except for some faint moonlight streaming through the boarded windows. 
Over here, Earl whispered from one of the rooms. He had found a hidden basement entrance beneath a floorboard, visualizing all kinds of dreadful scenarios waiting for us down there while we descended didn't help our current situation at all. We didn't even know what time it was, but deep down, we knew that time was running out. The basement was damp and moldy, a far cry from the cozy, music-filled atmosphere of my car on my way to the theater only hours ago. We tried to barricade the door but soon realized that it was pointless. If the dogman wanted to get in, there wasn't much we could do to stop it. Tad found a partially sealed bottle of whiskey under some debris. Shaking hands reached for the dusty bottle, accepting each other's misery as an unwritten apology. We drank to forget, at least for a while, what was happening outside. Just as dawn broke through the darkness, according to my watch, 6.33 a.m., there came a sudden, powerful bang on the basement door. We hardly had time to react before the dogman broke in, its fur slick with blood and its eyes glowing malevolently as it stepped closer and closer. Before any words escaped our lips as we faced our horrifying fate, we heard a shrill scream coming from somewhere outside the house, followed by multiple gunshots, shattering the silence we held like a sacred pact by consent. We don't know who intervened that morning, Maybe someone heard Earl's desperate cries for help earlier, or maybe some silent companions traversed forsaken routes nearby. But whatever happened, they saved us in our darkest hour from that wretched creature called Dogman. Rescued by their arrival or distraction, whatever it could be called for how it took no more than minutes before everything fell silent except our breaths catching up with us in unison. We quickly made our escape without hesitation. As I arrived back home and crawled into my bed, trying to find some semblance of safety in its familiarity, I couldn't shake off what had happened to us just hours ago. No more than two days had passed since my performance at the theater. I didn't know if the dogman targeted Tad and Earl or if it had been lurking nearby only to ambush whoever crossed its path. I vowed never to take Route 92 in those silent woods again. No one could say with any certainty what had become of the creature we'd encountered that night. But one thing was clear, some memories, no matter how much we struggled to escape or ignore them, would forever haunt us in strange places where reality fractures and the grisliest hells come alive, hidden in plain sight. I remember the exact date like it was yesterday, August 11th, 2018. It was my cousin's bachelor party, and we went camping with a group of his friends in a remote area of Yellowstone National Park. None of us were experienced campers, but it was the perfect excuse to get away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life, crack open some beers and tell funny stories around the campfire. The day started off smoothly. We arrived at our designated spot, set up all our equipment, and spent the afternoon down by the river, laughing at mishaps and horrible attempts at fishing. As the day turned into night, we retreated back to our tents and lit a large fire, exchanging humorous stories about our childhoods until exhaustion set in. In those blissful moments before sleep took over, I remember thinking that maybe this city boy could get used to the great outdoors. Little did I know how quickly my opinion would change. Around 2 a.m., I awoke to a sickeningly faint growl accompanied by a foul stench filling my nostrils. My natural skepticism kicked in, all but jokingly dismissing it as one of my cousin's friends playing a cruel prank. For a minute or two, I lay there trying to rest, only for the growling and gut-wrenching smell to intensify. It was infuriatingly rank, 
like rotting flesh and damp fur mixed together. My anger at the prankster grew steadily until movement outside my tent caught my attention. Curious, I unzipped the door to confront them, only for my annoyance to dissipate in an instant. To this day, I can't put into words just how terrifying that moment was when eyes met eyes with something otherworldly. The beast standing yards away from me looked like something birthed from the darkest corners of my nightmares, covered in thick matted fur so dark it seemed to drink in the surrounding shadows. Its body was twice the size of a bear, and it quivered with living, pulsing muscle. The snout resembled that of a dog or wolf, but its eyes were too human, too cruel. He growled one last time before turning and vanishing into the darkness. I didn't know how I managed not to scream, but before long, everyone else was awake and fumbling about in confusion. It felt like an eternity until we finally got our act together and decided we needed to get away from whatever hellish entity we disturbed. The crunch of gravel beneath our tires felt like freedom as we made our way down the winding roads towards safety. We were panicked and frantic in our discussions. Had we been hallucinating? Should we alert the authorities? Our questions morphed into something darker when some news sites surfaced reports from other campers of similar experiences. Days passed, and while settling back into my life, I found myself grappling with my own sanity and beginning to label what happened as some frightening wilderness stew fueled by alcohol. That's until I received a call from one of my cousin's friends last night. His voice was unsteady as though he had been on the edge for some time. Apparently, his neighbor's mutilated cattle appeared exactly like how he described the grisly scene he had stumbled upon months ago, just after that horrific night. The fear it elicited reminded him of our camping trip and spurred him to tell me that some members of our group were planning on returning to Yellowstone in hopes of finally discovering just what it was that tormented us on those haunted grounds. It was then that an unsettling premonition washed over me. What if this thing saw this as an invitation? What if this creature found each one of us somehow? What hope would any CMP or hiker have against something so terrifyingly real? In that moment of bone-chilling terror, I closed my eyes and let out a shuddering sigh of relief. After that terrifying call, my mind raced with unsettling thoughts. A part of me was relieved that I didn't join the group returning to Yellowstone, knowing that something sinister awaited them. I stayed away, in the relative safety of my city life, watching my friends through their social media updates. The next evening at 8 p.m., I received a text message from one of my friends, Paul. It read, We shouldn't have come back here. There's something terribly wrong. I immediately dialed his number, my hands shaking as the phone rang. Paul, what's happening? I managed to stutter out. Man, it started last night, soon after we returned to the campsite. That disgusting smell and strange growling returned. Paul whispered fearfully. It was different this time, though. We started discovering mutilated animals around the site, just like what happened with my neighbor's cattle. My heart pounded heavily as I listened to Paul recount the disturbing details with a quivering voice. No one sleeps anymore, he continued. Everyone is on edge, bickering and fighting out of fear and exhaustion. I pleaded with him to leave immediately. It wasn't safe to stay any longer, despite their impulse for answers. But before I could convince him further, Paul suddenly fell silent on the other side of the line. The silence felt suffocating. Every second felt like a lifetime. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, Paul whispered with horror laced in his voice. It's here. The call disconnected abruptly. Overwhelmed with dread and concern for my friend's well-being, 
I contacted local law enforcement in their area through an emergency line. It felt strange getting involved from afar, but I knew too much to be silent. The next day brought me grim news. My friends decided not to leave while the police conducted a thorough search around their campsite but found nothing unusual. That night, those gruesome sights escalated to a horrifying point. One of the campers had been brutally attacked. Pieces of his torn flesh littered the surrounding area, his body nearly unrecognizable. It broke my heart to learn that the creature had claimed a human life turning the joyous camping trip into a bloodbath. My friends abandoned their plans and returned home, leaving behind them an unspoken pact never to return to Yellowstone or mention their grisly findings again. Days passed without any new information about the mysterious attacker. It was as if the beast simply disappeared back into whatever hell it crept out of, leaving only terror and grief behind. News of the event spread quietly among those who knew about it. Whispers were uttered cautiously, lest we provoke its unwanted attention. On Thursday evening at 5.15 p.m., I decided to visit Paul at his house. When I walked inside, his sunken eyes showed just how much he had been haunted by that awful ordeal. His hands trembled as we talked but what truly chilled me were the gnarled scratches on the walls he once called home, evidence that our tormentor didn't care about boundaries. The creature could reach us anytime, anywhere it wanted, a grim realization that settled in heavily. Years passed without further incident, though, and our once perpetual fear subsided into an unnerving memory left unspoken at family gatherings and friendly reunions. But even now, as I tell this story from years past, I can't shake a heap of uneasy emotions resting deep within my chest. The mysterious beast that tore through our campsite remains out there, as though watching silently from afar, waiting for someone else foolish enough to cross its path. Sometimes I can't help but think perhaps this was nature's twisted way of reminding us city folk that we're in its domain now. And no matter how far we venture or how much we think we understand, there are still horrors lurking in the shadows we could never comprehend. All we could do was hope that by letting our tale be known, others would take heed and refrain from following in our footsteps. Last week, during a reunion with some college friends, we were all having a blast catching up with each other. We've always enjoyed trading humor-filled stories from our respective travels, making one another laugh with absurd tales and well-placed jokes. However, a particular event that happened to me a few years ago still sends chills down my spine whenever I recollect it and I took the opportunity to share the horrific experience I had gone through during a camping trip to Pisgah National Forest. At the time, what was supposed to be a fun and adventurous weekend turned into sheer terror because of the unforeseen antagonist lurking within those woods, an encounter I could never have been prepared for. The weather during that weekend was ideal for camping, with sunny skies above and crisp night air surrounding us throughout our trip. My friends and I sat around a blazing fire at our campsite deep within the forest, exchanging light banter and roasting marshmallows to make es mores after spending all day trekking through the picturesque landscapes. Suddenly, we heard rustling noises in the distance. At first, we brushed it off as maybe just some deer foraging in the foliage. After all, this was their territory far more than it was ours. But then, the rustling intensified, along with some inaudible growls. We exchanged uneasy glances before I reached for my flashlight. With my heart throbbing like mad in my chest, I shone the beam of light towards where we had heard the peculiar sounds emanating from. 
only to reveal something that seemed to defy rational explanation. There stood an enormous beast, towering over eight feet in height and covered in dark, twisted fur that glistened with an oily sheen under the moonlight. It appeared somewhat like a grotesque fusion of man and wolf, its piercing eyes gleaming crimson, though this could have just been attributed to the reflection of our fire. JVM, my closest friend on the trip and a proud skeptic, finally managed to stutter from behind me. What the fuck is that? Cautiously, we all backed towards our camp's entrance, determined not to provoke this seemingly otherworldly entity any further. The beast stared at us intently as it moved with an unsettling grace that shook me to my core. I thought to myself, this thing couldn't possibly be real. I'd heard tall tales of werewolves and dogmen in my time, urban legends whispered around campfires by bored kids just like ourselves. But what I saw that night wasn't just some far-fetched fairy tale. And I can tell you now that there isn't enough whiskey in the world to erase that image burned into my memory. In an instant, the monstrous figure launched itself toward one of our friends like lightning in a blizzard. Its massive claws raked through both her tent and her body with ease, spattering blood on the surrounding trees. She barely had time to scream before she went limp, though her final moments would undoubtedly linger with us forevermore. Panic-stricken, we desperately scattered and trampled over each other in a mad sprint back to our cars parked at the trailhead only a mile or so away. We could hear the bone-chilling howling sounds echoing behind us as we clashed against branches and rocks within our path, each rapid heartbeat and drumming footfall punctuating this terrifying pursuit. As we frantically raced towards the trailhead, the terrifying image of the beast remained vividly etched in my mind. Its flesh hung from it like tattered rags, revealing powerful, pulsating muscles beneath. The creature's jaws were filled with dagger-like teeth, perfect for tearing apart any living thing unfortunate enough to cross its path. Time seemed to slow down as we desperately stumbled through the underbrush trying to put as much distance as possible between us and the horrifying monster that was chasing us. Seconds felt like eternity before we finally came upon a small clearing. Our pounding hearts threatened to leap from our chests as we huddled together under a massive oak tree, our collective breaths shallow and uneven. The chilling howls and snarls grew quieter, though still present enough to remind us that this nightmare was far from over. Just after 2.15 a.m., while huddled under that oak tree, Tasha began to sob quietly. The stress of the harrowing ordeal had taken its toll on her nerves. A few of us tried our best to comfort her while keeping one eye trained on the dark woods surrounding us. The beast seemed to have backed off momentarily, but we couldn't ignore the fact that our friend was lying lifeless back at camp, and we had no idea if this relentless monster would ever allow us to escape this forest alive. Tasha's panic intensified just after 3 a.m., and in her desperation to escape, she suddenly bolted from our hiding spot near the tree. Her instinctual flight response had cost her dearly. Within seconds, the creature was on her. Its claws tore into her easily, like a hot knife through butter. Blood splattered everywhere as she barely managed a horrified scream before being thrown lifelessly across the clearing. She suffered multiple lacerations all over her body and her face had been partially torn away from her skull by the beast's violence. The sight of her mangled corpse sent the remaining survivors into a new wave of blind panic. With renewed determination, we sprinted towards the trailhead as quickly as our adrenaline-fueled bodies could carry us. As we reached the cars around 4.25 a.m., the howling seemed even more distant. We hastily scrambled into our vehicles and sped away from that wretched place, praying that the monstrous creature wouldn't follow. 
Tears welled up in everyone's eyes as we mourned the loss of two friends and tried to come to terms with the gruesome horrors we had just witnessed. Over the next few days, authorities would scour the area, unable to locate any trace of the vicious creature. They ruled the deaths as a result of animal attacks, dismissing our accounts of what happened as trauma-induced hallucinations. Our dead friends' families never received closure or any true explanation for their violent and tragic demise. Our once tight-knit group was forever changed by that horrifying night. We all carried the heavy burden of guilt and an unnerving question. Why were our lives spared by such a merciless predator? The days turned sour with nightmares and questions left unanswered. No one spoke of it ever again. No one dared to return to that cursed place. The gruesome memories continued to haunt me every night. I can't help but feel marked by some inescapable fate. Though I have searched for years, I've never found any proof that such a beast exists outside of legends passed down through generations. It seems that some darkness is simply too awful and harrowing to allow itself to be captured or killed, doomed forever to haunt my nightmares and torment my waking moments. For me and those who survived that terrible night, there would be no end to this nightmare, only an eternal reminder of our vulnerability against forces beyond comprehension, lurking within the deepest reaches of nature's sinister embrace. I must have been driving through eastern Kentucky for at least two hours trying to make up for lost time after taking a wrong turn on the highway. I was on my way to see my cousin Maggie in Virginia, and I had already texted her that I might be arriving pretty late. As dusk began to settle in, I started looking for a place to grab some dinner. I eventually found a little roadside diner called Granny's Grim Grill and decided to give it a try. The place was packed with locals who seemed to know each other well, chatting and laughing while they enjoyed their meals. The friendly waitress, whom everybody called Mama Sue, took my order and then began sharing stories with me about the growing popularity of dogmen's sightings in the area. She told me how people had reported seeing these massive beasts that were part human and part dog roaming around nearby forests but no one was able to catch one or even get a clear enough photo to prove their existence. My curiosity piqued. I decided to ask around at Grandma's Grim Grill to find out more about these dog men. One old-timer named Earl told me about his buddy Frank, who claimed, while out hunting one night, he had come face to face with one such creature when it suddenly stepped out from behind a tree just yards in front of him. Frank said the thing snarled at him and quickly bounded off into the darkness before he could do anything. Now, I've heard strange things before, but having met Frank earlier that evening at the bar and listening to his tale firsthand, he didn't seem like a man prone to making up stories. Later that night, as I was heading down a remote road toward Maggie's house, I suddenly began feeling uneasy. The trees loomed over the pavement like gnarled fingers clawing at the sky above me. As if on cue, fog rolled in, only heightening the tension I felt. My attention was drawn to something in my peripheral vision, causing me to slow down and squint into the darkness. As I continued driving, my headlights caught the large silhouette of an animal in the bushes by the side of the road. Scared out of my wits, I slammed on my brakes, my heart pounding in my chest. The beast quickly scaled a nearby tree with ease before scrambling over a branch and out of view. Staring up at where it had vanished, I couldn't believe what I had seen, a creature that appeared to be a mix between a man and a dog. It had long, muscular limbs covered with coarse hair, 
large, menacing eyes that seemed to glow in the headlights, and its elongated, snarling snout revealed razor-sharp teeth capable of inflicting serious harm. Suddenly, another car appeared behind me, lights flashing urgently. As I began rolling down my window to speak with the other driver, a young woman about twenty years old implored me frantically. Please, get back in your car and go, she yelled. They're not just stories. Get out of here now. Heart pounding twice as fast now, I threw the car into drive and sped off toward Maggie's place. Once there, I did tell her about what had happened that night and everything people at Granny's Grim Grill had shared with me about dogmen prowling these parts. Days later, on my way home from Maggie's house, after having started researching this phenomenon online during brief rest stops along the interstate, you can trust me when I say that these unexplainable events didn't just fade away from my memory like those caused by pure adrenaline or fear do. But instead, they nod at me like some malevolent thread pulling itself loose within the human fabric of rational consciousness. That evening, two days after my encounter with the dogman, I sat on the front porch of my cousin's house. I could barely shake the thought of that beast and its terrifying appearance out of my mind. The news spread like wildfire among the residents of Maggie's small town, and they were afraid. It seemed that the dogman had also left his mark, as people reported their pets missing and distant cries echoed through the night. It was close to 7 p.m. when I saw a police car rushing down the road, sirens blaring. As it passed by Maggie's house, I couldn't help but wonder if they'd found any evidence of the creature. And then a deep sense of dread washed over me. Had something horrible happened? My fear compounded as I heard commotion a few houses down. Swiftly, I stood up and walked towards the noise. When I arrived at the scene, the sight was nothing short of horrifying. The police had cordoned off a part of the street since a body was lying there in a pool of blood. The face of the lifeless person was badly mangled and torn beyond recognition. It was as if an animal had pounced on him with sheer ferocity, leaving nothing behind but tattered flesh and shattered bones. Trembling, I overheard a couple of policemen talking about what they observed at the crime scene. I've never seen anything like this, one cop muttered. This wasn't done by any animal we're familiar with. It's savage, another chimed in. Do you think this is related to those dogman rumors going around? Just then, one officer saw me eavesdropping and sternly told me to step back. This area wasn't meant for civilians. As I made my way back to Maggie's house, curiosity got the better of me. Maybe someone had seen something and could give more information about the dogman. I knocked on a few doors trying to coax out information from the paranoid townsfolk. Even though they were scared, most seemed just as curious as I was. Finally, one elderly lady named Ethel told me that she heard something around the time of the attack. She mentioned a deep, gut-wrenching growl that sent shivers down her spine. She peered through her window in fear and caught a glimpse of the retreating figure, as it disappeared into an alley with unnerving speed. Her description matched that of the dogman perfectly, with long, muscular limbs covered in coarse hair and a monstrous snout bearing its razor-sharp teeth. This sinister confirmation solidified my worst fears. Not only was this beast entirely real, but also terrifyingly lethal. As I stumbled back to Maggie's house, trying to process everything I had found out, an uneasy realization dawned on me. The beast had come closer than ever before. It was no longer sticking to the shadows or dense forests around town. It had attacked someone among us. The following day, law enforcement stepped up its efforts, 
patrolling through town and posting warnings everywhere, urging residents to stay indoors after dark. But that nagging sense of unease never left me as I prepared to leave Maggie's place. A few days later, back home and surfing through news articles about dogmen, I found a story about another attack in a nearby town. The victim met the same gruesome fate, torn apart by something vicious and relentless that scared townsfolk could only attribute to the dogmen. As much as we hoped this nightmare would recede into obscurity, it became increasingly clear that these occurrences were not mere rumors or stories meant to scare children. The creature roamed these towns freely and dealt death with merciless efficiency. With fear coursing through our veins every day after dark, we lived our lives aware of the lurking monster, the dogman. But ultimately, we couldn't change what had happened. We couldn't find the creature to avenge the lives it had callously snuffed out. So we carried on, our lives forever marred by the horrifying truth we now lived with. No matter where we went or what precautions we took, the dogman was out there, and none of us could ever be truly safe again.